Me and my son, Jake, decided to go on an ice fishing trip up in Alaska. It was something I used to do with my old man, and I wanted to pass it on. The frozen lake stretched for miles, surrounded by the cold, quiet wilderness. We set up our gear, drilling holes in the ice. The sun was setting, casting this eerie orange glow. That's when a group of locals showed up. They seemed friendly, cracking jokes and offering some of their catch. They were rough looking, but they laughed and shared stories about fishing in these parts. As night fell, we invited them to sit by the fire we'd made. We thought it'd be a good time, swapping tales and enjoying the solitude. The locals, though, started getting too familiar. They asked too many questions about where we were staying, if we were alone. Made my skin crawl a bit, but I tried to brush it off. Jake was getting tired, so we decided to call it a night. The locals insisted we follow them to a better spot. I hesitated, but they seemed harmless enough. We packed up our gear, and they led us deeper into the wilderness, away from the lake. The woods got thicker, and the snow deeper. Red flags started popping up in my mind. We reached a clearing, and the locals turned hostile. They demanded our money, our tear, everything. They weren't just friendly fishermen anymore, they were predators. I tried to reason with them, but they weren't having it. They got aggressive, pulling out knives and making it clear they meant business. Panic set in, and I knew we were in deep trouble. Jake clung to me, scared out of his mind. We fought back, but it was three against two, and they were ruthless. They took everything we had, leaving us stranded in the freezing wilderness. They laughed as they disappeared into the night. We were left shivering, battered, and without a way back. We stumbled through the snow, trying to find our way back to civilization. The cold bit into us, and Jake was fading fast. I had to keep him awake, keep moving. Fear and anger fueled me as we trudged through the dark. Hours later, we stumbled upon a cabin. It looked abandoned, but we had no choice. We broke in, desperate for shelter. The air inside was cold, and the place smelled musty. We found some blankets and tried to get warm. The night was endless. Every sound outside made us jump. I kept thinking about those locals, wondering if they were still out there. We had nothing left, just the bitter cold and the uncertainty of what lay ahead. Morning came, and we mustered the strength to keep going. We found a road, flagged down a passing car, and told them our story. The locals had vanished, leaving us with a haunting memory of a fishing trip turned nightmare. The police got involved, but those guys were like ghosts. No trace, no leads. It was as if they were part of the wilderness, blending in until they decided to strike. Jake and I made it back, scarred by the encounter. I left the party, tired but content, waving goodbye to my friends. The train station was eerily quiet, the platform deserted. I rushed towards the last train, grateful it hadn't left yet. Boarding it, relief washed over me, and I found a seat near the window. Exhaustion coursed through my body, and I welcomed the idea of resting during the journey home. I must have dozed off because when I awoke, the train was at a standstill. Darkness enveloped the surroundings, an unfamiliar desolation outside the window. Panic surged within me as I realized this wasn't my stop. The train should have ended its journey long before this desolate station. Anxiety nodded in my stomach. I checked my phone, no signal, no notifications. It felt surreal, the train at a halt in the middle of nowhere. The carriages were empty, save for me. 
I strained to peer outside, but it was pitch black, save for the dim glow of the train's interior lights. With a trembling breath, I stepped onto the platform. No station lights, no sign of life. I was utterly alone. My mind raced, contemplating the next move. Panic started to nod me, urging me to get back on the train, to stay safe within its confines. But that option was gone, the train had departed. The only choice was to search for help. I hugged my coat tighter around me and started walking, hoping to find any semblance of civilization. The path seemed endless, shadows stretching across the deserted landscape. Fear crept in, each step feeling heavier, more uncertain. Then, two figures emerged from the darkness, a pair of men, their silhouettes dark against the night. My heart hammered in my chest. I stopped, uncertainty seizing my movements. They approached slowly, speaking amongst themselves in hushed tones. Their words were indistinguishable, but their presence was unnerving. I tried to reason with myself, to dismiss the anxiety as paranoia. Maybe they were just stranded like me, looking for a way out. But unease settled in as they drew closer. Their faces were obscured in the dim light, expressions hidden. I couldn't gauge their intentions. One of them spoke, his voice low and gravelly, asking if I needed help. His words sent shivers down my spine. I nodded, trying to keep calm, but their proximity felt suffocating. My instinct screamed at me to run, to flee from these strangers in the dead of night. I stammered a response, trying to appear composed. But their demeanor was unsettling, an underlying threat in their presence. They exchanged glances, almost as if communicating without words. Fear gripped me tighter, a sense of vulnerability overwhelming my senses. One of them stepped closer, too close for comfort. My pulse raced, and I backed away, feeling the cold metal of the train platform behind me. Their intentions seemed sinister, and I realized I was trapped between the darkness and the strangers. I mustered every ounce of courage and asked if there was a nearby town or if they had a phone. But their response was evasive, dismissive. They seemed more interested in my presence than helping. Dread settled in, a knot of dread and alarm in my chest. My mind raced, contemplating escape routes, looking for any possible way out of this ominous encounter. But fear paralyzed me, rendering me incapable of rational thought. Their proximity was suffocating, their presence oppressive. The situation escalated as they stepped closer, their intentions becoming clearer, menacing, malicious. Panic consumed me, and I made a desperate dash, my feet pounding against the uneven ground, heart pounding in my chest. Their voices echoed behind me, growing distant as I sprinted, tears blurring my vision. The night air stunned my lungs, the adrenaline pushing me to keep running, to escape their clutches. Every step felt like an eternity, fear driving me forward. I finally found a secluded spot, hidden away, and crouched, trying to stifle my erratic breaths. Fear pulsed through my veins, my mind reeling from the chilling encounter. I stayed hidden, praying for daylight, for any sign of help in the desolate night. Minutes felt like hours as I remained frozen, waiting, hoping for dawn's arrival. The night seemed endless, silence enveloping the surroundings. But as the first light crept over the horizon, relief washed over me. Shaken and trembling, I gathered the courage to move, to find my way back to safety, vowing never to forget that night. We thought it would be a great family trip, camping in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. An RV, some supplies, and the promise of adventure. Little did we know, 
our dream getaway would turn into a living nightmare. The drive to the Ozarks was scenic, and we were excited as we found a quiet spot to park the RV. Surrounded by towering trees, it felt like our private piece of nature. But the tranquility was short-lived. On the first night, strange noises echoed through the woods. Rustlings and whispers that didn't fit with the usual sounds of nature. We brushed it off, attributing it to local wildlife, but a knowing feeling of unease settled in. The next morning, we met some seemingly friendly locals. They warned us about the wildlife and shared tales of the Ozarks. As night fell again, so did the temperature, and a chill crept into the air. We huddled in the RV, trying to shake off the unease that had settled over us. That night, shadows danced outside our windows. Footsteps echoed in the darkness. Every creak and crack of the RV felt amplified. I went out to investigate, but there was nothing. Just the dense darkness of the Ozark night. As the days passed, the locals' friendliness turned into something more sinister. They watched us, silent figures observing our every move. Their eyes held a cold intensity that sent shivers down my spine. I began to question the wisdom of our Ozark adventure. One evening, we discovered something unsettling. Hidden cameras, strategically placed around our campsite. The realization hit us like a punch to the gut. We were being watched, monitored by unseen eyes with unknown intentions. Conversations with the locals took a turn for the cryptic. Failed threats, dark warnings that made no sense. The once welcoming atmosphere of the Ozarks transformed into a web of paranoia and fear. We were outsiders, and the locals made it clear we were not welcome. One night, the situation escalated. We heard chanting in the distance, a haunting melody that sent shivers down our spines. It was accompanied by flickering torchlight, drawing us to a clearing where the locals gathered. Their faces were obscured, hidden by shadows and the eerie glow of the flames. Our RV became a fortress, the only barrier between us and whatever malevolent force lurked in the Ozark shadows. Every night, we huddle inside, straining our ears to catch any signs of the unseen watchers. Escape became an obsession. We felt like prey, surrounded by a darkness that seemed to close in with every passing day. The once charming Ozark Mountains became a maze, with us desperately seeking a way out. Our RV was vandalized, tires slashed in the dead of night. Panic set in as we realized the locals were closing in, their intentions unknown but undoubtedly dangerous. We were trapped, hostages to the mysterious force that gripped the heart of the Ozarks. One night, we decided to make a run for it. We drove through the winding roads, our headlights cutting through the Ozark night. But the locals pursued us, a caravan of shadows in pursuit. The chase was a blur of fear and desperation, our RV navigating the treacherous terrain with the relentless pursuit of our unseen tormentors. Finally, we reached the edge of the Ozarks, leaving the haunting landscape behind. The locals, their figures disappearing into the darkness, halted their pursuit. We drove for hours, not daring to look back until the sun bathed the landscape in its early morning glow. We were on a road trip, me and my fiancé, just cruising down the highway. It was getting late, and we decided to stop at this small, run-down motel we spotted. It looked deserted, but we were too tired to keep driving. The motel clerk seemed off, this uneasy vibe about him. He gave us a room key without much conversation, just this cold, distant stare. I didn't like it, but I brushed it off thinking maybe he was just tired or had a bad day. As we settled in the room, things felt eerie. The place had this musty smell, 
and the flickering lights made it feel like something out of a horror movie. My fiancé laughed it off, saying it had a certain charm, but I couldn't shake off this feeling of discomfort. Later that night, I woke up to this strange noise outside our window. I peeked through the curtains and saw this man standing in the shadows, staring at our room. It sent shivers down my spine, this feeling of being watched by a complete stranger in the middle of nowhere. I nudged my fiancé awake, whispering about the man outside. He went to check, but when he looked out, there was no one there. I felt this overwhelming fear, this sense of someone lurking just beyond our sight. We tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't shake off this feeling of dread. It felt wrong, this strange man watching us in the dead of night. The next morning, we mentioned it to the motel clerk, but he brushed it off, saying it must have been a misunderstanding. He seemed dismissive, like he didn't want to talk about it. We decided to stay another night, thinking maybe it was just our imagination playing tricks on us. But that night, it happened again, I woke up to that same noise outside the window. I mustered the courage to look, and there he was, that man, staring directly at us. I screamed for my fiancé, and he rushed to the window, but the man was gone again. I felt this overwhelming panic, this fear that something sinister was happening. We packed our things immediately, not wanting to stay another second in that place. As we were leaving, I saw the motel clerk talking to the man outside, this eerie exchange that sent chills down my spine. We drove off, feeling this sense of relief, but I couldn't shake off the fear from that encounter. I felt like that man was still watching us, following us somehow. We stopped at a diner to grab a bite, trying to shake off the unease. But as we left, I saw him again, that man, standing across the street, staring at us with this menacing look. It was terrifying, this feeling of being targeted by a stranger we encountered at that creepy motel. We tried to lose him by taking different routes, but he kept appearing, always watching us from a distance. It felt like he was following us, this relentless pursuit that sent waves of terror through me. I called the police, but without evidence of any crime, there wasn't much they could do. We felt trapped, this feeling of being stalked by someone who seemed to have ill intentions. We decided to drive straight to a busy area, hoping to lose him in the crowd. It seemed to work for a while, but then I saw him again, this time right behind us in traffic. I felt this overwhelming sense of dread, this fear that he wouldn't stop following us. We made a sudden turn, trying to lose him, but it was no use. He kept following, this relentless pursuit that felt like a nightmare. I was terrified, not knowing what he wanted or why he was fixated on us. We finally reached a police station, rushing inside for help. The man didn't follow us inside, disappearing into the streets. I felt this immense relief, but the fear still lingered, this feeling of being targeted and hunted by a stranger. The police took our statement, but without much to go on, they couldn't do much. I felt this overwhelming sense of vulnerability, this fear that he might appear again at any moment. We changed our plans, trying to avoid the areas we had been to before. But I couldn't shake off this fear that he was still out there, somewhere, watching and waiting. I was working security at this hotel, my usual night shift routine. It was quiet, just me and the surveillance monitors flickering with the footage from the cameras across the floors. Around midnight, I noticed something odd. There was this figure on the screen, slipping into different rooms while the guests were out. It was eerie, this sense of intrusion that made my skin crawl. I thought it might be a mistake, a glitch in the system, but as I kept watching, I saw it happening repeatedly, different rooms, different floors. Someone was definitely sneaking into the guests' rooms. 
I felt this growing dread, this fear that something sinister was happening right under our noses. I called the front desk, but they assured me that everything was fine, that there were no security breaches. I couldn't shake off the feeling of responsibility, this need to protect the guests, so I decided to investigate. I went up to one of the floors where I'd seen the intruder on the cameras. As I walked down the hallway, the silence was suffocating. I checked the rooms, and they seemed undisturbed from the outside. But that sense of someone watching, someone sneaking around, it made my heart race. I reached a room that had been targeted on the camera feed. I knocked, announcing myself as hotel security, but there was no response. I used the master key to unlock the door, slowly pushing it open. The room looked normal, but something felt off. I went in, scanning every corner, checking closets and under the bed, but there was no sign of anyone. I felt this chill run down my spine, this overwhelming sense of unease. I couldn't shake off the feeling that someone had been there, that they might still be lurking around. I went back to the security room, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. I reviewed the footage again, this time focusing on the areas where the intruder had entered the rooms. That's when I saw it, this shadow moving swiftly down the hallway, slipping into another room. It was chilling, this figure moving with such stealth, such precision. I called the front desk again, trying to explain what I'd found, but they brushed it off, saying it was probably a maintenance worker or something. But I knew what I'd seen, it wasn't right, it wasn't normal. I continued monitoring the cameras, my eyes glued to the screens, watching for any sign of that intruder. I felt this knot in my stomach, this fear that something dangerous was happening and no one was taking it seriously. Hours passed, and then, I saw it again. That same figure, moving between rooms, like they knew exactly where to go, exactly when to strike. I couldn't just sit there, I had to do something. I rushed to the floors where the intruder had been spotted, trying to catch a glimpse, trying to put a stop to it. But every time I got close, every time I thought I might catch them, they vanished, as if they knew I was coming. It was unnerving, this game of cat and mouse, this fear of the unknown. I called the police, trying to explain the situation, but without solid proof, they couldn't do much. I felt this frustration, this helplessness in the face of something so unsettling. The night dragged on, and the intruder continued their silent invasion of the guests' rooms. I felt this growing sense of dread, this fear that something terrible might happen, that the guests might be in danger. I tried to keep watch, to stay alert, but the fear nodded me, this realization that I couldn't protect everyone, that I might not be able to stop whatever was happening. Finally, as dawn approached, the intruder vanished from the cameras. I felt this mix of relief and fear, this uncertainty about what had just occurred. The next day, I reported everything to the hotel management, but they dismissed it, saying it was probably a technical glitch or a mistake in the system. But I knew what I'd seen, what I'd witnessed on those cameras, it was real, too real to be ignored. I was staying at this hotel, you see. It was a big deal for me because I was meeting my long-lost family the next day. I'd never seen them before, and the excitement was mixed with nerves. It was late in the evening, and I was going through some papers in my room, getting everything ready for the meeting. That's when I heard this soft rustling sound at the door. I thought it might be room service or something, but when I checked, there was no one there. Curious, I looked around, and on the floor, I found this folded paper. It was a note, and the words on it made my blood run cold. It said, leave this hotel now if you value your life. My heart pounded, and my hands trembled as I read it over and over, trying to make sense of it. 
I felt this growing fear, this sense of impending danger that I couldn't ignore. I checked the door, but there was no one outside, no one nearby. I tried to dismiss it as a prank, as someone messing around, but the note felt real, too real to be taken lightly. I called the front desk, trying to sound casual, asking if there had been any security issues in the hotel lately. The receptionist assured me that everything was fine, but I couldn't shake off that feeling of unease. I double-checked the locks, pulled the curtain shut, trying to feel safe, but the fear lingered, this terror of the unknown. I barely slept that night, tossing and turning, the warning note haunting my thoughts. I kept looking out the window, expecting something to happen, someone to show up. Morning came, and I hesitated about going to meet my family. But I couldn't let fear dictate my life, right? So, I gathered my courage and headed downstairs, trying to keep a calm facade. I met my family, and it was a mix of emotions, excitement, and anxiety. They were welcoming, happy to see me, but in the back of my mind, that note lingered, this fear that something was wrong. We spent the day together, catching up, sharing stories, and for a moment, I almost forgot about the ominous warning. But as evening approached, that fear returned, this sense that danger was looming. I went back to my room, trying to push away the feeling of dread. I opened the door, and there, on the floor, was another note. This one was even more direct, more menacing. It said, you've been warned. Leave now, or else. I felt this chilling shiver run down my spine, this fear that someone was watching me, someone who wanted me out of that hotel, out of their way. I called the front desk again, trying to sound composed, but inside, I was panicking. I asked if they could check the security cameras or if they had seen anything suspicious. They promised to look into it, but their reassurances did little to ease my fear. I couldn't stay there any longer. The warning was too ominous, too threatening. I packed my bags in a rush, this growing terror pushing me to leave that place. As I left the room, I noticed this figure at the end of the hallway, someone wearing a hood, their face obscured. They turned and vanished around the corner before I could make out any features. Panic surged through me, this fear that someone was following me, someone who meant harm. I rushed to the front desk, told them I had to leave immediately, that I was feeling sick and needed to go. They didn't question it, just helped me check out quickly. I left the hotel, feeling this overwhelming sense of relief mixed with terror, this fear that I had narrowly escaped something dangerous. I must have dozed off on the couch again. You know how it is, just watching TV late at night, drifting away without even realizing it. But when I opened my eyes, it wasn't my living room I saw. The TV wasn't there, the familiar walls were gone. Panic seized me instantly, that gut-wrenching terror that knots her insides. I was in a cabin, deep in the woods. How did I get here? What happened? I couldn't recall a thing. The air felt different, stuffy, heavy. The room was dimly lit by a flickering lamp, shadows dancing ominously. I stumbled to my feet, my heart pounding so loud I swear I could hear it echoing in the silence. It was a small place, run down, the kind you'd see in old horror movies. I didn't recognize anything, and that only added to the terror creeping up my spine. The door was locked bolted shut. The windows were no help either, just blackness beyond them, like staring into an endless void. It felt like a nightmare, but every time I pinched myself, the nightmare just got worse. I had to get out, find some semblance of reality. I searched frantically for a way, scrambling through my mind for any clue, any memory that could anchor me. But it was all blank, an empty canvas. 
I mustered every ounce of courage, every shred of hope, and forced the door open. Fresh air hit me, a brief moment of relief. But it didn't last. As I stepped outside, terror took hold once more. The woods were dense, an impenetrable wall of darkness. Fear whispered in the rustling leaves, in the howling wind. I heard footsteps behind me. Heavy, deliberate. My heart thundered in my chest as I ran, fueled by primal instinct, by sheer terror. I didn't know where I was going, just away. Away from that cabin, away from whatever nightmare I'd stumbled into. The woods were disorienting, a maze of shadows and tangled branches. I tripped, stumbled, felt branches clawing in my skin. But I didn't stop. I couldn't. The footsteps grew closer, the sound of them right behind me. I dared a glance back and saw a figure, a man, pursuing me with relentless determination. His face was shrouded in darkness, but I could feel his intent, his malice. I ran faster, the adrenaline masking the pain in my lungs, the agony in my legs. Fear was my fuel now, pushing me beyond my limits. But no matter how hard I tried, he was right there, closing the gap. I didn't know where I was heading, but I knew I couldn't let him catch me. Every breath burned, my heart threatened to burst from my chest. But the fear of what would happen if he caught up spurred me on. Branches whipped at my face, roots threatened to trip me at every step. I stumbled, nearly fell, but I kept going. My mind raced, frantically searching for any way out of this nightmare. The trees seemed to close in around me, the darkness pressing in from all sides. I felt like prey, cornered, with nowhere to run. It was suffocating, the terror palpable in the air. I glimpsed a clearing up ahead, a faint glow of moonlight. It was my only chance. I pushed myself harder, willing my legs to move faster, to outrun the horror chasing me. I burst into the clearing, gasping for air, my lungs burning. But there was no relief, no safety. The moonlight revealed the man standing just a few feet away, his twisted grin sending shivers down my spine. I stumbled back, my mind racing for a way out. But there was nowhere left to run. He lunged, and I fought, desperation giving me strength I didn't know I had. We grappled in the darkness, the sounds of our struggle echoing through the night. I fought with all I had, every instinct screaming for survival. Adrenaline surged, but so did fear, a paralyzing terror that threatened to consume me. It was a fight for my life, a fight I couldn't afford to lose. I landed a blow, felt the impact reverberate through my hand. He staggered, and in that split second, I ran. I didn't look back, didn't stop until I collapsed, breathless and trembling, far from that cabin, far from that nightmare. I don't know how I ended up there, in that cabin in the woods. It's a blur, a terrifying gap in my memory that I can't explain. But one thing's for sure, I'll never forget the chilling terror of being lost, hunted, in the depths of those woods. You ever heard of Creepy Hollow Road? Yeah, that backwoods stretch of asphalt locals whisper about, the one said to swallow up lost souls and spit out rusted husks. Well, guess who had the bright idea of delivering a pizza there at 3 a.m., thanks to a GPS crapping the bed? Yours truly. It started normal enough. Rain drumming on the windshield, radio spitting static, headlights slicing through the inky blackness. Then, the GPS went haywire, spitting me onto a road marked closed on every map known to man. But hey, $40 tip says otherwise, right? So, I ventured in. Creaky Hollow wasn't just dark, it was oppressive. Trees clawed at the sky like skeletal fingers, 
shadows dancing macabre cheeks on the pavement. My headlights barely pierce the gloom, revealing gnarled branches scratching against the fan like spectral nails. Then, the order. Delivery for Mr. Blackwood, the app chirped, the address in abandoned farmhouse at the end of the road. My skin crawled. No lights flickered, no car parked in the weeds. But the app insisted, the timer ticking down like a death knell. Cut churning, I crept out, pizza box clutched like a talisman. The porch creaked beneath my boots, each groan echoing in the hollow night. A cold wind whispered through the skeletal trees, carrying a faint, acrid smell like burnt hair and forgotten dreams. Then, a scratching sound, coming from beneath the porch. I froze, breath hitching in my throat. A pale claw, long and twisted, sneaked out from the darkness, moonlight glinting off a wickedly curved tip. It scrabbled against the wood, inches from my foot. I stumbled back, heart hammering against my ribs. The pizza box skittered from my grasp, landing open on the porch. The scratching stopped. An unearthly silence descended, broken only by the rustle of unseen things in the undergrowth. Then, another sound. A low, guttural growl, rising from the darkness beneath the porch. It vibrated through the floorboards, sending shivers down my spine. A monstrous shape slithered out, casting a grotesque silhouette against the moonlit wall. I didn't scream. I didn't even breathe. I just stared, paralyzed by primal fear, as the creature uncoiled, revealing itself in all its horrifying glory. Skeletal, with fur-like matted tar and eyes that glowed like dying embers, it was something straight out of a nightmare, a beast woven from the shadows of that cursed road. It lumbered towards me, its fetid breath washing over me, and in that moment, a primal scream ripped from my throat. I turned and ran, adrenaline driving me like a demon. I didn't look back, didn't care about the pizza or the tip. All I wanted was to get out of that cursed place, to put miles between me and the nightmare I'd witnessed. I don't know how I escaped. My van roared through the darkness, headlights carving fleeting tunnels through the suffocating blackness. I only know that when dawn finally broke, painting the sky a bruise purple, I was miles away, still shaking, the stench of burnt hair clinging to my clothes like a ghostly souvenir. They don't believe me, of course. The cops think it was a prank, the dispatchers chalk it up to fatigue. But I know what I saw. I tasted the fear felt the icy breath of that monstrosity on my skin. I was just a guy looking for a peaceful spot to park my RV near Mendocino, California. The coastline seemed like the perfect escape from the chaos of daily life. Little did I know, this quaint town had a dark secret beneath its serene facade. I found a secluded spot, surrounded by towering redwoods. The air was crisp, and the rhythmic crash of waves against the cliffs created a soothing soundtrack. It all seemed idyllic, until I noticed something off about the locals. People stared a little too long their eyes carrying an unsettling intensity. Whispers followed my every step, and the once friendly greetings felt like failed warnings. Ignoring the odd vibes, I set out to explore the town. As I wandered through the charming streets, I stumbled upon a gathering in the town square. The residents stood in a circle, their faces obscured by hooded cloaks. Curiosity got the better of me, and I edged closer, trying to make sense of the bizarre scene. The air grew thick with tension as I witnessed their ritual. The townsfolk chanted in a language I couldn't comprehend, their movements synchronized in an eerie dance. Unsettled, I retreated, convincing myself it was just a quirky local tradition. Night fell, and the RV became my refuge. I could feel the weight of their stares lingering, a sense of being watched from the shadows. Sleep eluded me, 
replaced by a gnawing unease that gripped my gut. As the days passed, the town's sinister underbelly revealed itself. Whispers turned into veiled threats, urging me to leave before it was too late. The once friendly locals now seemed like mere actors in a macabre play. One evening, I witnessed something that shattered any illusion of normalcy. A hidden door, obscured by vines, led to a secret chamber beneath the town. It was there that I discovered the true extent of their rituals, the darkness that permeated every corner. Fear became a constant companion as I navigated the thin line between secrecy and survival. The townsfolk, with their disturbing ceremonies, seemed determined to ensure I never left Mendocino alive. Paranoia gripped me, every creak in the night sending shivers down my spine. Desperation took hold as I tried to unravel the mystery shrouding the town. Late night excursions revealed hidden symbols, cryptic messages etched into the town's architecture. The more I discovered, the clearer it became that I was an unwelcome outsider in a community bound by something far more sinister than I could comprehend. The once charming coastline transformed into a claustrophobic nightmare. I knew escape was essential, but every attempt was thwarted by the residents' unnerving vigilance. It was as if the town itself conspired to keep its secrets hidden from prying eyes. The locals became increasingly aggressive, their veiled threats escalating into open hostility. Sleepless nights turned into a relentless battle for survival. I felt like prey, cornered by an unseen predator with a hunger for the unknown. One fateful night, as the moon cast long shadows across the town square, I made my move. Stealthily navigating the darkened streets, I evaded their watchful eyes and reached the outskirts of Mendocino. The distant hum of my RV's engine felt like a victory cry. With every passing mile, the town's suffocating grip loosened. Yet, the nightmares lingered, the echoes of their rituals haunting my every thought. So, me and my buddies decided to splurge on a luxury yacht for a Mediterranean cruise. Seemed like a dream, right? But this vacation was about to take a turn into nightmare territory that we never saw coming. The yacht was top-notch, everything we hoped for. We were excited, thinking this was going to be the best trip ever. But then, as the days went by, tension started bubbling within the group. It was like the confined space of the yacht was amplifying every little disagreement. One evening, as we sailed under the moonlit Mediterranean sky, we spotted this mysterious boat on the horizon. It wasn't like any regular vessel, it seemed intent on getting close to us. We shrugged it off at first, thinking maybe it was just another group enjoying the open sea. But as the mysterious boat got closer, things got weird. It started tailing us, staying just at the edge of our vision. Panic set in as we realized this wasn't some casual encounter on the Mediterranean, it felt more like we were being hunted. The atmosphere on the yacht went from party vibes to pure tension. We couldn't shake off the feeling that the mysterious boat had some dark intentions. The open sea that once seemed like our playground now felt like a vast, unpredictable expanse of danger. As the night deepened, the mysterious boat started making aggressive maneuvers. It was like a game of cat and mouse on the open sea. Tensions within our group rose even higher, the confined space of the yacht becoming a pressure cooker of fear. We tried to radio for help, but the responses were garbled, as if the sea itself was against us. The crew on the mysterious boat seemed relentless, their intent unclear but undoubtedly menacing. It was like a horror movie unfolding in real time on the Mediterranean. The yacht's engine started acting up, sputtering as if it had a mind of its own. Panic turned into desperation as we realized we were at the mercy of the mysterious boat. The Mediterranean, once a symbol of leisure, now felt like a treacherous expanse that held our fate. Then, out of nowhere, the mysterious boat rammed into our yacht. 
The impact sent shockwaves through the vessel, and we stumbled and clung to whatever we could. It was chaos, the sea spray hitting us as we tried to comprehend the nightmare unfolding. The yacht's crew rushed to assess the damage, but it was clear we were in trouble. The mysterious boat circled like a predator, its crew probably reveling in the terror they had inflicted upon us. Our tree Mediterranean crews had turned into a nightmare on the open sea. As we desperately tried to repair the yacht, the mysterious boat kept its menacing presence. It felt like they were toying with us, pushing us closer to the edge of fear and despair. The confined space of the yacht became a prison, and the open sea turned into a vast, ominous abyss. Hours passed, and the mysterious boat continued its relentless pursuit. We were exhausted, physically and mentally drained. The luxury yacht that once felt like our sanctuary now seemed like a sinking ship in the face of this relentless menace. Finally, we managed to get the yacht's engine working, but the mysterious boat wasn't done with us. They continued their pursuit, the relentless waves echoing the terror within our hearts. It was like a never-ending nightmare on the Mediterranean, the sea holding us captive in a night of terror. As dawn broke, the mysterious boat finally veered off, disappearing into the horizon. We were left battered, shaken, and haunted by the encounter. The Mediterranean, once a symbol of leisure, now held the memory of a nightmarish ordeal that changed our lives forever. We docked at the nearest port, reported the incident to the authorities, but the mystery of the menacing boat remained unsolved. There we were, pumped up for Coachella. Me and the gang, ready to dive into the music, the vibes, you know, the whole shebang. We've been looking forward to this for ages. The festival grounds were massive, people from all walks of life converging to celebrate music. We were soaking it all in, going from stage to stage, dancing like nobody was watching. The atmosphere was electric. As the sun set, the neon lights took over, and the headliners hit the main stage. It was pure magic. But in the midst of all this euphoria, something felt off. A weird energy that you couldn't quite put your finger on. In the sea of faces, we started noticing a group that seemed out of place. Dressed in dark clothes, they weren't there for the music. They were there for something else. As we moved through the crowd, they seemed to follow. Paranoia? Maybe. But it felt real. We changed direction, and they'd adjust their course, like they had their eyes on us. We decided to test it out. Went to the food stalls, took a detour through the art installations, but they were always there. Watching. Waiting. Our excitement turned into unease. Then, at the quieter edges of the festival, away from the pulsating beats, we saw them huddled together, exchanging something that didn't look like festival merchandise. It was like they had their own agenda within this sea of celebration. Curiosity got the better of us. We decided to eavesdrop, act like we were just chilling nearby. The bits we caught were chilling, whispers about a plan, a meetup, something happening after the festival. A whole other layer to this party we didn't sign up for. As the night wore on, we noticed more of them blending in. It wasn't just a few, it was a network, a web, each person with a role in whatever scheme they were cooking up. Our group tried to stay inconspicuous, but it felt like we were being herded into a trap. It was like a horror movie, and we were the unsuspecting cast. Midnight approached, and the festival crowns took on a surreal vibe. The neon lights, once enchanting, now seemed ominous. The group we'd been tailing started moving with purpose, converging near the exit. That's when we made the call, ditch the festival, get out before whatever was about to unfold. 
we weren't sticking around to find out their end game. We maneuvered through the crowd, avoided their gazes, and slipped away. As we left the festival behind, we saw a convoy of unmarked fans pulling up, the shady group ushering people inside. We made it to safety, but the night was marred by the realization that beneath the pulsating music and the carefree festival atmosphere, there was something sinister at play. What were they planning? What kind of twisted after-party did we narrowly escape? We never found out the answers, but Coachella, for us, was forever tainted. The music may have been the headline, but that hidden agenda, lurking just beneath the surface, left us with an unforgettable horror story instead of cherished festival memories. I was in Miami, you know, a solo vacation. Figured I'd treat myself to some sun, sand, and whatever else the city had to offer. Strolled along the beach, the waves crashing, and the sun kissing my skin. Just your typical Miami day, until this guy, a photographer, approached me. He had this friendly vibe, charisma oozing from every pore said he was working on some portfolio or whatever and thought I'd be the perfect model. Flattering, right? I mean, who doesn't want a free photo shoot in Miami? We set a time, late afternoon, when the golden hour hits. Seemed legit, nothing fishy. He had a camera, tripod, the whole deal. We started snapping pics, him directing me to pose this way and that. Everything was cool, the sun casting this warm glow, waves in the background. Instagram worthy, I thought. Then, slowly, things got weird. He started suggesting, you know, more risque poses. I'm no prude, but it felt off. I hesitated, but he was persistent, like he had this hidden agenda. That friendly demeanor turned into something sinister. I tried to steer the shoot back to normal, casual poses, but he wasn't having it. Kept pushing boundaries, getting uncomfortably close. I started feeling uneasy, like I'd stumbled into some shady operation. As the sun dipped lower, so did my comfort level. He suggested we move to a more secluded spot for better lighting. Alarm bells were ringing, but I brushed them off. Stupid move. We walked further down the beach, away from the crowds. That's when he dropped the act. His camera was still dangling from his neck, but now he was too close, hands fumbling. My gut screamed danger. I knew I had to bail, but I didn't want to escalate things. You know, stay cool, find a way out without making a scene. He hinted at this private shoot idea, and I'm thinking, no way, dude. Panic started bubbling up. My mind raced through escape plans. I pretended to get a call, whipped out my phone, and walked away, acting like it was an emergency. Smooth, right? I headed back toward the busy part of the beach, scanning for any sign of him following. Heart pounding, palms sweaty, I realized I'd narrowly dodged something seriously messed up. I saw him lingering in the distance watching. My solo Miami trip took a dark turn, from picturesque photo shoot to this creepy encounter. I shuddered at the thought of what might have happened if I hadn't trusted my instincts and made a quick escape. It was supposed to be the perfect celebration, our destination wedding in Bali. The lush landscapes, the vibrant culture, it felt like a dream. Little did we know that paradise could unravel into a nightmare. The venue, a beachside resort, was idyllic. The sea breeze played with the floral decorations as we exchanged vows. Friends and family gathered, the joy palpable. But beneath the surface of our happiness, a storm brewed. 
we discovered that a local group disapproved of our union. They believed it defied tradition, clashed with their cultural norms. We were caught in a whirlwind of disapproval, and our dream wedding became a battleground. The first signs were subtle, a disapproving glance from a passing local or hushed conversations that fell silent as we approached. Whispers reached us, tales of disapproval spreading like wildfire. We tried to ignore it, to focus on our celebration, but the tension grew. As we danced under the stars, we felt the weight of their disapproval. A group of locals watched from a distance, their eyes filled with resentment. We didn't understand the depth of their objection, but it cast a shadow over our joy. The following day, as we explored the vibrant markets, the disapproving glares intensified. A local elder approached us, his words sharp with criticism. He spoke of traditions, of our intrusion into their way of life. The confrontation left us shaken. As the days passed, the hostility escalated. We encountered hostility in unexpected places, a waiter at a local restaurant, a vendor in the market. Their resentment seeped into every aspect of our celebration. One evening, as we strolled along the beach, we were confronted by the disapproving group. Their leader, a stern-faced man, accused us of disrespecting their culture. Tensions escalated, and we found ourselves in a heated exchange, surrounded by locals echoing their disapproval. We retreated to our resort, but the hostility lingered. Our joyous celebration had become a battleground, and we felt like intruders in a place that had initially embraced us. The staff at the resort, though sympathetic, could do little to shield us from the growing resentment. One night, we returned to our villa to find it vandalized. The walls were smeared with messages of disapproval, and our belongings were scattered. Fear crept us as we realized the extent of the animosity. Desperate, we sought help from the local authorities. Their response was tepid, acknowledging the cultural clash but offering little resolution. It seemed the disapproval was deeply ingrained, an unyielding force that resisted outside intervention. As we approached our departure date, the tension reached its peak. The disapproving group gathered outside the resort, their presence menacing. We feared for our safety and decided to leave Bali earlier than planned, our dream wedding reduced to a harrowing escape. The flight back was a mix of relief and sorrow. We left behind the beauty of Bali, tarnished by an encounter we never anticipated. All right, so I'm this filmmaker, right? Decided to shoot a documentary on a beach in Cannes, thinking it's all sunshine and glamour. But, man, did things take a turn I never saw coming. Started off pretty standard. Set up my equipment, got the crew together. We were capturing the glitz and glamour of the film festival, interviewing actors, directors, the whole shebang. Everything seemed normal until we realized there was this other film crew hanging around. These guys weren't friendly competitors, there was something off about them. They'd shoot us these dirty looks, like we were encroaching on their territory. I shrugged it off initially, thinking maybe they were just protective of their documentary, like we were of ours. As days passed, things got weirder. They started shadowing us, always a step behind. I catch glimpses of them in the background of our shots, like they were deliberately trying to mess with our footage. It was annoying, but I didn't think much of it until we stumbled upon their dark secret. Late one night, while reviewing the day's footage, we noticed something odd. There, in the background of an interview, we spotted one of their crew members exchanging a briefcase with a shady-looking character. Looked like some shady deal was going down, right there on the Ken Beach. Curiosity got the better of us. We decided to investigate, camera rolling, thinking we'd stumbled upon some cinematic gold. Little did we know, it was a rabbit hole we should have left untouched. We followed their crew, lurking in the shadows, feeling like amateur detectives. 
Turns out that Shady Deal was just the tip of the iceberg. They were involved in some kind of illegal film distribution ring. Piracy, maybe? I don't know. I'm not a detective. As we delve deeper, we discovered they were sabotaging other film crews, stealing footage, trying to take down the competition. That included us. Suddenly, our little documentary on the Ken Beach became a cat and mouse game with these underground filmmakers. Tensions escalated fast. Confrontations turned into full-blown arguments. We catch them red-handed trying to mess with our gear, delete our footage. It was like a twisted version of filmmaking hell. One day, it got physical. I found myself in a scuffle with one of their crew members. Cameras went flying, and there we were, grappling on the sandy kin shore. It wasn't what I signed up for, and the irony of a filmmaker resorting to fisticuffs wasn't lost on me. The authorities got involved, and the festival turned into a chaotic mess. Our documentary became a twisted tale of deception and rivalry, a story I never intended to tell. Sailing the Bermuda Triangle is like playing with fire, and I should have known better. Our crew, a ragtag group of sailors seeking adventure, had heard the stories, ships disappearing without a trace, strange occurrences in the mysterious waters. But youthful arrogance often drowns out caution. The day was sweltering, the sea mirroring the cloudless sky. The ship cut through the calm waters, excitement in the air as we approached the infamous region. Laughter echoed as we exchanged tales of what awaited us in the Bermuda Triangle. Then, on the horizon, an eerie sight, a ship, ancient and desolate, bobbing aimlessly like a forgotten relic. Curiosity mingled with trepidation as we decided to investigate. It was as if time itself had abandoned this vessel, leaving it to rot in the heart of the enigmatic triangle. Boarding the abandoned ship, the air hung heavy with a palpable tension. The creaking of wooden boards beneath our feet reverberated through the silent corridors. Our flashlights flickered, struggling against the oppressive darkness that seemed to devour their feeble beings. Each step felt like a descent into the unknown. It didn't take long to realize that this ship was more than just a forsaken hulk, it was a vessel of nightmares. Rusty chains dangled from the ceiling like macabre decorations, and the stench of decay wafted through the stagnant air. As we explored further, a subtle sound reached our ears, whispers, soft and haunting. Yet, no lips moved, and the shadows cast by our flashlights seemed to dance to an invisible rhythm. The crew exchanged uneasy glances, the bravado of earlier replaced by a shared unease. The ship, once silent as the grave, began to come alive. Unearthly groans echoed from the bowels of the vessel, and flickering lights illuminated forgotten corners. Panic rippled through the crew as we realized we were not alone, Unseen eyes watched our every move. It started subtly, whispers growing into disembodied voices that spoke in languages unfamiliar. The air grew thick with a suffocating malevolence, and a sense of dread settled over the ship like a shroud. Sleep became elusive as nightmares plagued our restless nights. Then came the apparitions, ghostly figures that materialized in the dimly lit corridors. Faces contorted in agony, eyes hollow and accusing. They didn't speak, yet their silent screams echoed through the haunted ship, etching terror into our souls. Fear gripped us, a visceral fear that transcended reason. The once joyful camaraderie dissolved into paranoia, suspicion breeding like a virus. Sleep deprived and tormented, the crew turned on each other, blaming the supernatural for our descent into madness. One by one, crew members vanished disappeared into the shadows, leaving behind only echoes of their anguished cries. The Bermuda Triangle, it seemed, hungered for our souls, and the ghost ship became a vessel of relentless torment. It was then that I saw him, a specter with hollow eyes, hauntingly familiar. It was the image of a crew member who had vanished weeks ago, his voice now part of the cacophony that echoed through the ship.
Keep backing me into the abyss, a silent plea for release. Desperation clawed at my sanity as I faced the supernatural entity. In the heart of the Bermuda Triangle, I waged a battle for my very soul. The ship, a purgatory for lost spirits, demanded a toll, and the crew, now reduced to a handful, clung to survival like drowning men grasping at flotsam. As the ship continued to unravel its spectral mysteries, I grappled with the realization that escape was an illusion. The Bermuda Triangle, a realm where the fabric of reality frayed, held us captive in its malevolent embrace. The ghost ship, a conduit between worlds, had become our nightmarish purgatory. Days blurred into nights as the battle between the living and the dead reached a fever pitch. Shadows danced to an unholy rhythm, and whispers became guttural chants that reverberated through the ship's hollow corridors. Madness clung to us like a relentless leviathan, its tentacles tightening with each passing hour. It was then, in the heart of that cursed ship, that I understood, the Bermuda Triangle was no mere stretch of ocean, it was a gateway to the supernatural, a realm where the boundaries between life and death blurred into indistinct shadows. As the remaining crew members dwindled, I faced the inevitable. The ghost ship, a purveyor of suffering, had claimed us all. The Bermuda Triangle, a malevolent force beyond comprehension, had woven our fates into its haunted tapestry. The ship, once an abandoned relic, now sailed eternally through the abyss, a vessel for lost souls ensnared in the Bermuda Triangle's spectral grip. I was cruising down a desolate stretch of highway in the vast southwest, just me and the endless desert horizon. The sun beat down, making the heat shimmer off the asphalt. My little car was my cocoon, the only company in this lonely landscape. As I drove, I noticed a big rig in my rearview mirror. It loomed larger with each passing mile, and I couldn't shake the feeling it was tailing me. Maybe just a fellow traveler on the same lonesome road, I thought, trying to dismiss the uneasy feeling settling in my gut. But as the miles rolled on, the truck stayed relentlessly close. I'd speed up, it would speed up, I'd slow down, it would slow down. It was like a dance under the scorching sun, and my heartbeat quickened with every move. I couldn't see the driver, just a massive metal beast behind me, and the feeling of being pursued grew. I glanced at the gas gauge, praying I wouldn't have to pull over in this desolate stretch. The truck's presence felt like a shadow, a relentless force that refused to let go. Desperation crept in as I scanned the barren landscape for any sign of civilization. The trucker, faceless in my imagination, seemed like an ominous specter against the vast desert canvas. The isolation of the southwest, once awe-inspiring, now felt suffocating. I tried to convince myself it was all in my head. Maybe the trucker had the same destination, and it was all a bizarre coincidence. But the paranoia lingered, an invisible weight on my shoulders, urging me to escape this relentless pursuit. With trembling hands, I dialed the local police, trying to articulate the growing fear in my chest. They assured me they'd send someone, but the vastness of the desert made me feel like a lone ant in a vast, uncaring world. As I pressed on, the truck's presence became more oppressive. It wasn't just following now, it was tailgating, a metallic menace on my tail. The desert, once expansive and awe-inspiring, now felt like a trap closing in. I took an abrupt turn onto a smaller road, hoping to lose my pursuer in the labyrinth of desert trails. But the truck followed, a relentless predator in this scorching wilderness. Panic set in as I realized there was no escape, just a vast desert swallowing us both. I floored the accelerator, my little car straining against the relentless pursuit. The sun blazed overhead, scorching everything in its path. The truck, a monstrous silhouette, refused to relent. The radio crackled with static, my desperate pleas for help drowned in the fast emptiness. In the distance, I spotted a gas station, 
a lone outpost in this desolate expanse. The hope of sanctuary fueled my resolve, and I sped toward it, the truck still hot on my heels. The gas station appeared like a mirage, a potential refuge from this nightmarish chase. I skidded into the station, tires screeching, and stumbled out of the car, gasping for breath. The truck pulled in behind me, its engine growling like a predatory beast. I sprinted toward the station, praying for someone to help, someone to intervene in this relentless pursuit. The gas station attendant, a weathered face framed by a trucker hat, eyed me with concern. I blurted out the situation, the fear, the pursuit, and he nodded knowingly. He radioed the police, his eyes narrowing as he glanced at the ominous trucker. As the police arrived, the trucker, finally revealed in the harsh daylight, wore a menacing scowl. The police questioned him, and I stood, shaken and exhausted, watching this faceless specter turn into a human with malicious intent. They arrested him, his dark motives lay bare in the harsh desert sun. The relief washed over me, but the desert seemed to retain the echoes of the chase, a vast, unforgiving canvas where a solitary traveler had faced a relentless pursuer under the scorching southwest sun. So, a few buddies and I decided to venture into the Louisiana Bayou for a fishing trip. We were looking for that authentic experience, you know? Swampy waters, moss draped trees, and the whole deal. We heard about this local guide, Old Man Thibodeau, who apparently knew those murky waters like the back of his hand. We met Thibodeau at the docks, a weathered man with a face etched with the tails of the bayou. He had this wild look in his eyes, like he'd seen things most folks would run away from. But hey, we thought it added to the authenticity, gave the trip a bit of a spooky edge. The day started normal enough. Thibodeau maneuvered the boat through the swamp, pointing out gators and exotic birds like a living encyclopedia. We caught a couple of fish, enjoyed the warm Louisiana sun, and everything seemed perfect. As evening crept in, that's when things got weird. Thibodeau, in his raspy voice, started telling us stories. Stories about the bayou, tales of mysterious disappearances, and legends of creatures lurking beneath the murky surface. At first, we brushed it off as local folklore, you know, part of the show. But as the sun dipped below the horizon, Thibodeau's demeanor changed. He became jittery, eyes darting around like he expected something to jump out of the shadows. We should have felt uneasy, but the bayou at night, it's a whole different world. Thibodeau steered the boat into narrower, darker channels. The moonlight barely penetrated the dense canopy, casting eerie reflections on the water. That's when we started hearing it, whispers in the night, faint murmurs that seemed to echo through the swamp. Our laughter from earlier died down as Thibodeau led us deeper into the labyrinth of the bayou. The air grew thick with tension, and we exchanged uneasy glances. I asked Thibodeau about those disappearances he mentioned earlier, hoping it was just a dramatic narrative to spook the city folks. His response, though, sent shivers down our spines. He claimed the bayou demanded sacrifices, appeasements to some ancient force that ruled those waters. Sacrifices offered willingly or taken forcefully, he said with a sinister grin. That's when we realized, this wasn't just a fishing trip. Thibodeau had a dark agenda, and we were at the mercy of the swamp's secrets. The boat slowed to a crawl, and Thibodeau's eyes gleamed with an unsettling hunger. Suddenly, he produced a rusty blade from his weathered jacket, and our hearts pounded in our chests. The whispers in the night grew louder, as if the bayou itself conspired against us. Panic set in, and we knew we had to escape this nightmare. In a moment of sheer adrenaline, we tackled Thibodeau, wrestled the blade away, and booked it. Through the tangled roots, under the looming branches, we ran like our lives depended on it because, in that twisted moment, they probably did. 
we stumbled back into the relative safety of the main channels, gasping for breath. The bayou, with its dark secrets, loomed behind us. Thibodeau, left stranded in the swamp, watched with that wild look in his eyes as we disappeared into the night. We reported the incident to the local police, but the bayou keeps its secrets. The disappearances, the sacrifices, it's all part of a dark dance that unfolds when the sun sets over the Louisiana swamp. Driving home alone on a stormy night was never something I enjoyed, but sometimes it couldn't be avoided. The rain was coming down a heart, making it difficult to see more than a few feet ahead of me. Lightning flashed in the distance, illuminating the road in brief, eerie bursts of light. As I navigated the winding country roads, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Glancing in my rearview mirror, I noticed a car following closely behind me, its headlights glaring in the darkness. At first, I thought nothing of it, perhaps they were just trying to get home like me. But as the miles passed, I realized that the driver behind me was driving recklessly, swerving in and out of lanes and tailgating me so closely that I could almost feel their breath on my neck. My heart began to race as I realized that they weren't just driving aggressively, they were trying to cause me harm. I tried to shake them off, speeding up and slowing down in an attempt to lose them, but they stayed right on my tail, their headlights looming ominously in my rearview mirror. Panic began to set in as I realized that I was completely alone on the deserted road, with no one around to help me if things went south. As the rain pelts down harder, I struggled to maintain control of my car, the tires slipping and sliding on the wet pavement. Lightning flashes overhead, casting eerie shadows on the road ahead. I can feel the fear gnawing in my stomach as I realize that I'm in real danger. Desperate for help, I reach for my phone, intending to call the police, but my hands are shaking so badly that I can barely hold onto it. I glance in my rearview mirror again, only to see the car behind me closing in fast, its headlights blinding me in the darkness. With a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, I realize that I have to think fast if I want to get out of this alive. I glance around for any sign of civilization, but all I see is endless fields stretching out into the distance, shrouded in darkness and rain. Suddenly, I spot a turn off up ahead, a narrow dirt road leading off into the trees. With no other options left, I veer off the main road and onto the dirt track, praying that it will lead me to safety. The car behind me follows suit, its headlights casting long shadows on the trees as it pursues me down the narrow road. I can hear the sound of branches scraping against the side of my car as I speed through the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest. I don't know how much longer I can keep this up, but I refuse to give up without a fight. I press down on the accelerator, pushing my car to its limits as I race through the night, the rain pounding down on the windshield like a thousand tiny fists. Suddenly, I see lights up ahead a small farmhouse nestled in the trees, its windows glowing warmly in the darkness. With a surge of relief, I realize that help is finally within reach. I pull into the driveway and leap out of my car, running towards the farmhouse as fast as my legs will carry me. Behind me, I can hear the sound of tires screeching on the gravel as the car behind me comes to a stop. As I reach the safety of the farmhouse, I pound on the door, screaming for help at the top of my lungs. Moments later, the door swings open, and a kindly-looking older couple peers out at me, concern written all over their faces. I try to explain what happened, but my words come out in a jumbled mess, the fear and adrenaline still coursing through my veins. The couple ushers me inside, offering me a warm blanket and a hot cup of tea as they listen to my story. They tell me that they'll call the police and get me some help, and I collapse onto the couch, trembling with relief. As I sip my tea and wait for the authorities to arrive, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if I hadn't found this farmhouse when I did. But one thing's for certain, I'll never forget the terror of that stormy night, or the feeling of being hunted by someone who wanted to do me harm.
It was a routine day on the North Sea, the waves crashing against the hull of our rescue boat. The radio buzzed with a distress call, a desperate plea for help from a ship lost amid the tempest. My fellow crew members and I sprung into action, navigating through the choppy waters towards the coordinates. As we approached the distress vessel, a shiver ran down my spine. The ship, battered by the unforgiving sea, looked like a ghost ship, abandoned to the mercy of the waves. The air was thick with tension as we boarded the vessel, greeted by an eerie silence broken only by the creaking of the ship. The ship's interiors were a chaotic mess, evidence of a struggle against the storm. Abandoned equipment, overturned chairs, and scattered belongings painted a picture of chaos. The ominous feeling intensified as we explored further, finding no signs of the crew except for one survivor. Huddled in a corner, a lone man, drenched and disoriented, mumbled about something unimaginable. His eyes held a haunted look, and his shaky voice struggled to convey the horrors he'd witnessed. He spoke of a conspiracy, of something sinister that led to the abandonment of the ship. I tried to make sense of his fragmented tale, a story of corruption, smuggling, and a crew's silence for knowing too much. It seemed absurd, like a plot from a B-grade thriller, but the man's distress was palpable. He spoke of shady dealings, powerful figures, and a cargo that wasn't what it appeared to be. My instincts told me there was more to this than met the eye, that I had stumbled upon a dangerous truth. The survivor begged for protection, claiming those responsible for the ship's fate would come after him. I radioed for backup, aware that our mission had transformed into something far more treacherous. As we waited for reinforcements, a sense of dread settled over the abandoned vessel. The man's paranoid glances made me uneasy, and I couldn't shake the feeling that our presence had attracted unwanted attention. Shadows seemed to dance in the corners, and every creak of the ship echoed with menace. Suddenly, a distant hum cut through the ominous silence. The sound of approaching engines sent a chill down my spine. The survivor's eyes widened in terror as he muttered, they found us. Panic set in, and the once deserted ship felt like a trap closing in on us. We prepared for the worst as an unmarked vessel emerged from the mist. Masked figures clad in black descended onto the abandoned ship. Armed and determined, they moved with the precision of a well-trained force. The survivors' fears had materialized, those responsible for the ship's fate had arrived. A standoff ensued, a clash between the unknown assailants and our rescue team. The once tranquil sea became a battleground, the waves witnessing a struggle for the truth. The survivor, caught in the crossfire, clung to the shadows, a pawn in a dangerous game. Amidst the chaos, I glimpsed the face of a man, a high-ranking official implicated in the survivor's tale. His cold eyes bore into mine, a silent warning not to delve deeper into the conspiracy. It was a battle not just against the sea but against a powerful adversary determined to protect their secrets. The confrontation escalated, shots fired, shouts echoing across the desolate vessel. The survivor, driven by fear, slipped away, disappearing into the labyrinth and corridors. Our rescue boat rocked with the violent clash, the sea mirroring the turbulence within. As the masked assailants retreated, their dark secrets protected, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were just pawns in a larger game. The survivor, the lone witness to the conspiracy, was gone, leaving behind unanswered questions and an unsettling truth, the sea held secrets darker than its depths, and our mission had plunged us into a perilous game of maritime intrigue. We decide to rent this fancy houseboat on Lake Tahoe for a relaxing getaway. Seemed like the perfect escape, you know? Just us, the shimmering lake, and peace. But nothing ever goes as planned. First day on the boat, everything's chill. Sun shining, breeze in our hair, sipping on drinks. We notice another boat cruising nearby, no big deal. Friendly waves exchanged 
we think it's just folks enjoying the lake like us. As the day goes on, that boat starts getting a bit too close. Like, uncomfortably close. We brush it off, maybe they're just bad at steering. But then, they match our speed, mirroring our every move. Weird, right? Night falls, and we dock for some shut eye. I wake up to the sound of another boat engine. Look out, and there they are, parked way too close. Freaked us out, but maybe they're lost or something. Give them a friendly wave, hoping they get the hint. Next day, we hit the lake again. Guess who's back? Yep, our new shadow. This time, they're not playing nice. Speeding up, closing in, and it hits us, they're following us. Panic sets in, we're just here for a good time, not some creepy cat and mouse game. We try to shake him off, make random turns, but they're persistent. Boat speeds up every time we do. What started as a relaxing getaway is turning into a bizarre thriller. We're not equipped for this, just a couple on a houseboat trying to escape an unnerving situation. Desperation sinks in. We're miles from shore, and this boat won't let up. We radio for help, but it's Lake Tao, fast and unforgiving. No one's coming to save us anytime soon. Adrenaline pumps through us as we navigate the boat, glancing over our shoulders to see if they're still there. Hours pass, and they're relentless. It's not fun anymore, it's downright terrifying. We start fearing for our safety. What do they want? Why are they chasing us? Panic turns into anger, frustration. We're trapped in this aquatic nightmare with no way out. As the sun sets, we contemplate making a run for the shore, abandoning the boat to escape whatever's happening. But they anticipate our moves, always blocking our path. It's like they know every move before we make it. Creepy as hell. Night falls again, and we're stuck in this never-ending pursuit. Exhausted, scared, we're running on fumes, physically and emotionally. The boat's engine drones on, a constant reminder of our helplessness. Sleep-deprived, paranoid, we become prisoners on this floating nightmare. Finally, after what feels like an eternity, we spot a marina in the distance. Hope surges within us. Maybe we can lose them in the maze of docks and boats. We push the houseboat to its limits, navigating through the marina's twists and turns. In a stroke of luck, we manage to lose our relentless pursuers. The marina becomes a refuge, a sanctuary from the madness. We dock, hearts pounding, and watch as the mystery boat fades into the darkness. We never found out who they were or why they chased us. Maybe some twisted game, a sick joke at our expense. All we know is that Lake Tao, once a serene escape, transformed into a realm of fear and paranoia that still haunts our memories. I'm just your average trucker, nothing fancy. Been on the road for years, hauling freight from one end of the country to the other. The Great Plains, vast and seemingly endless, have become my second home. There's a routine to it, a rhythm that keeps me going. One day, my rig started acting up, sputtering and coughing like an old man with a heavy smoker's cough. I couldn't risk a breakdown in the middle of nowhere so I pulled into a little mechanic shop on the outskirts of a quiet town. The place looked like it had seen better days, but sometimes those are the best places to get a quick fix. I walked into the shop, greeted by the smell of motor oil and the distant clang of tools. The mechanic, a burly guy with oil-stained overalls, looked up from under the hood of another truck. I explained my issue, and he nodded, grumbling something about a quick look. As he worked, I wandered around the shop, killing time. It was then that I noticed something strange, a series of scratched marks on the concrete floor, leading to a trapdoor in the corner. 
It piqued my curiosity, and I couldn't help but wonder what secrets this mechanic was hiding beneath the surface. The mechanic finished up, claiming it was just a loose belt. I paid up, but my mind was still fixated on that trapdoor. I concocted some excuse about needing to stretch my legs and casually strolled toward it. Opening it revealed a dark, narrow staircase leading into what seemed like an underground chamber. My heart raced as I descended into the dimly lit space. The air was heavy, filled with a peculiar smell, not the usual crease and oil, something more sinister. The walls were lined with shelves, not filled with spare parts, but with rows of mysterious containers. My eyes widened as I realized they were filled with human organs, preserved like macabre trophies. I stumbled back, my breath catching in my throat. The mechanic had followed me down, a sinister smile on his face. He revealed the grim truth, an illegal organ trafficking operation thriving beneath the facade of a simple mechanic shop. My discovery meant trouble for him, and the smile twisted into a snarl. Terrified, I sprinted back up the stairs, my mind racing with the realization that I'd stumbled into something far darker than a routine pit stop. I burst out of the shop, fumbling for my phone to call the police. The mechanic chased after me, a malevolent force unwilling to let me expose his gruesome secret. As I spoke to the dispatcher, detailing the horrors below the mechanic shop, the mechanic lunged at me. Fear and adrenaline surged through my veins as I dodged his grasp. The police promised to arrive soon, but the mechanic wasn't backing down. I sprinted through the quiet town, the mechanic hot on my heels. Panic set in as I realized I was alone in this fight, trying to outrun a man who had something to hide, something monstrous lurking beneath the shop. I ducked into alleys, zigzagged through deserted streets, but he was relentless. The town, once a peaceful backdrop to my routine pit stop, transformed into a labyrinth of terror. My breaths came in ragged gasps as I desperately searched for a way to escape. The distant wail of sirens signaled the arrival of the police, but the mechanic's pursuit intensified. I rounded a corner, finding myself face to face with an abandoned warehouse. Without thinking, I darted inside, seeking refuge in the darkness. The mechanic followed, the eerie silence broken only by the echoes of our footsteps. Fear clawed in my throat as I navigated the labyrinth and interior, the dim light revealing the shadows of forgotten crates and rusted machinery. I found a hiding spot, heart pounding, praying the police would arrive in time. The mechanic prowled the warehouse, a predator in pursuit of its prey. I held my breath, every footstep of his sending shivers down my spine. The warehouse became a battleground of suspense, the mechanic closing in with each passing second. The distant wail of sirens grew louder, signaling the approaching police. In the darkness, our fates hung in the balance, a collision of ordinary routine and a nightmarish secret lurking beneath the Great Plains. I was finally rescued and to this day I still have nightmares about what happened. A few years back, I was on a long stretch of highway, tired as hell, looking for something to keep me awake. That's when I found it, the late night radio show. The signal was weak, the voice on the radio scratchy and distorted. It was some guy talking in a low, almost hypnotic tone. He had this eerie charisma, drawing me in like a moth to a flame. I couldn't explain it, it felt like he was speaking directly to me. He called himself the Night Watchman, and the topics he dealt into were bizarre, like secrets hidden in plain sight, the darkness beneath the surface of everyday life. It was chilling, but I couldn't turn it off. His voice echoed through the cab, seeping into my mind like a fog. The Night Watchman began talking about desires buried deep within us, things we never admit to wanting. 
It was unnerving, and I found myself hooked, unable to resist the pull of his words. He spoke of a different reality, one where inhibitions were cast aside and primal instincts ruled. As I drove through the night, his voice took on a hypnotic quality. I felt like a passenger in my own truck, his words steering me into uncharted territory. The road became a blur, and my surroundings twisted into a surreal landscape. The night watchman started issuing commands, strange and unsettling. He spoke of a hidden world where true freedom awaited, but only for those brave enough to embrace the darkness. I couldn't resist, it was like a compulsion, a force beyond my control. He told me to pull over, somewhere remote, away from prying eyes. I found a desolate spot, the darkness swallowing the truck. The radio crackled with his instructions, pushing me to do things I'd never consider in my right mind. It was as if the night watchman had taken control, puppeteering me from the airwaves. I stepped out into the cold night, the radio still playing his hypnotic monologue. The instructions grew more disturbing leading me to the cargo hold. My hands moved mechanically, opening the trailer with a sense of dread gnawing at my insides. The cargo, precious and innocent, was now at the mercy of the night watchman's commands. I shuddered at the realization of what I was doing, but I couldn't break free from his influence. It was like a nightmare unfolding in the dead of night. The night watchman reveled in the chaos, his voice escalating as I followed his every directive. The cargo became a sacrificial offering to the dark forces he spoke of, and I was just a pawn in his twisted game. As the night wore on, the trance began to lift. I found myself standing alone, surrounded by the consequences of my actions. The cargo, once secure and untouched, now bore the scars of a nightmarish ordeal. The radio fell silent, the night watchman's ominous presence fading into the static. I was left alone in the cold night, haunted by the realization of what I had become a pawn in a macabre radio show that pushed me to the edge of sanity. I went for my usual morning run hoping to clear my head and start the day off right. The sun was just beginning to rise, casting long shadows across the deserted streets. As I jogged along, I couldn't help but feel a sense of exhilaration, the cool morning air filling my lungs as I pushed myself to go faster. But then, as I reached the edge of town, I decided to take a shortcut through the woods to save time. It seemed like a good idea at the time, a chance to mix up my routine and explore a different route. Little did I know, it would be a decision that would change my life forever. As I ventured deeper into the forest, the trees closed in around me, their branches reaching out like skeletal fingers to grab at my clothes. I tried to shake off the feeling of unease that gnawed at the pit of my stomach, telling myself that I was being silly, that there was nothing to be afraid of. But then I realized I had strayed off the path, the familiar landmarks disappearing into the dense undergrowth. Panic began to rise within me as I realized I was lost, disoriented in a maze of twisted branches and looming shadows. I tried to retrace my steps, to find my way back to the safety of the main trail. But every turn I took seemed to lead me deeper into the heart of the forest, further away from the world I knew and into a nightmare of my own making. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard it, the sound of footsteps echoing through the trees, growing louder and closer with each passing moment. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to listen, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. I knew I had to hide, to find some place safe until whoever, or whatever, was out there passed by. With trembling hands, I ducked behind a thick cluster of bushes, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I waited for the danger to pass. But as the footsteps drew nearer, I realized with horror that they were coming directly towards me. I held my breath, praying that whoever it was would just keep walking, that they wouldn't find me cowering in the underbrush. 
But then I saw him, a pair of shadowy figures moving through the trees, their faces obscured by the dim light of the forest. My blood ran cold as I watched them draw closer, their footsteps growing louder and more menacing with each passing moment. I knew I had to do something, to make a run for it before it was too late. With a surge of adrenaline, I pushed myself to my feet and bolted from my hiding spot, my heart pounding in my chest as I raced through the trees with all the speed I could muster. But no matter how fast I ran, they were always right behind me, their footsteps echoing through the forest like a death knell. I could feel their hot breath on my neck, their hands reaching out to grab me with cruel intent. I stumbled and fell, my knees hitting the hard forest floor with a dull thud as I struggled to catch my breath. I glanced around wildly, searching for any sign of escape, but all I could see was darkness stretching out in every direction. And then, just when I thought all hope was lost, I saw it, a faint glimmer of light shining through the trees, the promise of salvation beckoning me towards it like a guiding star. With renewed determination, I pushed myself to my feet and raced towards the light, my heart pounding in my chest as I pray for deliverance. And finally, after what felt like an eternity, I burst through the trees and into the clearing beyond, the warm rays of the sun washing over me like a benediction. I collapsed to the ground, my body trembling with exhaustion and relief as I realized that I had escaped the nightmare that had threatened to consume me. As I lay there, gasping for breath and trying to make sense of what had just happened, I vowed never to stray from the path again, to stick to the safety of the familiar world I knew. Hitchhiking through Europe had always been a dream of mine. The idea of freedom and adventure on the open road seemed exhilarating. So, when I found myself stranded on a lonely stretch of highway in the Czech Republic, I didn't hesitate to stick out my thumb and wait for a ride. It wasn't long before a car pulled over, and a charming stranger offered me a lift. He seemed friendly enough, with a disarming smile and easy conversation. I climbed into the passenger seat, grateful for the chance to continue my journey. As we drove, we talked about our travels and shared stories of our adventures. But as the miles passed by, I began to feel a growing sense of unease. There was something off about the way he looked at me, a hunger in his eyes that made my skin crawl. I tried to brush off the feeling, telling myself that I was just being paranoid. But deep down, I knew that something was seriously wrong. I kept a wary eye on him, trying to gauge his intentions as we continued on our journey. Suddenly, he took a sharp turn off the main road and onto a deserted country lane. Alarm bells rang in my head as I realized that we were heading into the middle of nowhere, far from civilization and help. Panic surged through me as I realized that I had made a dangerous mistake. I knew that I had to get out of the car, to escape before it was too late. But as I reached for the door handle, he locked the doors and turned to face me with a sinister grin. I felt a cold chill run down my spine as he reached into the glove compartment and pulled out a knife. My heart pounded in my chest as he brandished the weapon, his eyes filled with malice. I knew that I was in serious danger, that my life was hanging by a thread. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I fought back with all the strength I had, striking out at him with whatever I could find. But he was too strong, too determined to overpower me. I could feel his hands closing around my throat, cutting off my air supply as he pressed the knife against my skin. In that moment, I thought that it was all over, that I would never see my loved ones again. But just when all hope seemed lost, I heard the sound of approaching footsteps outside the car. With a surge of adrenaline, I redoubled my efforts to fight back, kicking and screaming with all the strength I had left. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the struggle was over. The door flew open, and I was pulled from the car by a group of passing motorists who had heard my cries for help. I collapsed to the ground, gasping for breath as they restrained my attacker and called the police. As I lay there, shaking and trembling with fear, I knew that I had narrowly escaped a terrifying encounter. 
but as I looked up at the faces of my rescuers, I felt a profound sense of gratitude and relief wash over me. I knew that I was lucky to be alive, that I had been given a second chance at life. And as I was whisked away to safety by the police, I vowed to never take the gift for granted, to always cherish every moment and live each day to the fullest. So, me and my buddies, we decided to go camping in this remote area known for its old mine shafts. We thought it would be cool to explore them, you know, just for kicks. Anyway, we found this old shaft hidden away in the woods, covered in moss and half hidden by fallen branches. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years, maybe even decades. But as we started to explore, we noticed something strange, there were signs of recent human activity down there footprints in the dirt, fresh scratches on the walls, that kind of thing. We tried to brush it off, to convince ourselves that it was just some hikers passing through or something. But deep down, I think we all knew that something wasn't right. As we delved deeper into the darkness, the air grew colder and the walls seemed to close in around us. It was like we were descending into another world, a world where the rules of reality no longer applied. And then, just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, we stumbled upon a horrifying secret hidden deep underground. It was a makeshift camp, with sleeping bags scattered on the floor and empty cans of food strewn about. But that wasn't the worst part, there were also tools, knives, and other weapons lying around, like whoever had been living there was preparing for something. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end as I realized that we weren't alone down there, that someone or something had been watching us from the shadows. We tried to leave, to get out of there before whatever was lurking in the darkness decided to make its move. But as we turned to go, we heard it, the sound of footsteps echoing through the tunnel, getting closer and closer with each passing second. We froze in terror our hearts pounding in our chests as we waited for whatever horror was about to reveal itself. But when nothing happened, we summoned up the courage to continue on our way. And that's when we found her, a young woman, chained to the wall of the mine shaft, her eyes wide with terror as she begged us for help. We didn't waste a second. We rushed to her side, breaking the chains that held her captive and helping her to her feet. She was shaking with fear, her skin pale and clammy to the touch. We didn't stop to ask questions. We just grabbed her hand and ran, our footsteps echoing through the tunnel as we raced to escape whatever nightmare lurked in the darkness. But as we neared the entrance to the shaft, we heard it, the sound of footsteps behind us, getting closer and closer with each passing second. We didn't dare to look back. We just ran faster our hearts pounding in our chests as we pray for a miracle. And then, just when we thought we couldn't run any further, we burst out of the shaft and into the blinding light of day. We didn't stop running until we were safely back at our campsite, the adrenaline coursing through our veins as we tried to make sense of what had just happened. We never did find out who the woman was or why she was down there. But one thing's for sure, we'll never forget the terror of that night. I went on a solo camping trip, seeking solace in the quiet of the wilderness, but what I found was far from peaceful. From the moment I arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, as if someone, or something, was lurking in the shadows, just beyond my line of sight. As night fell and darkness descended upon the forest, my paranoia only intensified. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of twigs, sent shivers down my spine, and I found myself jumping at the slightest sound. I tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination, that there was nothing out there but the trees and the animals, but deep down, I knew that something wasn't right. I built a fire, hoping that the warmth and light would keep whatever was out there at bay, 
but it offered little comfort as I huddled close, scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard it, a low, guttural growl echoing through the trees, sending chills down my spine. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen for any other sounds, but all I heard was the eerie silence of the forest at night. I tried to tell myself that it was just an animal, but something about the sound didn't sit right with me. It was too deep, too menacing, like nothing I had ever heard before. I considered packing up and leaving, but the thought of wandering through the dark woods alone was almost as terrifying as whatever was out there, so I stayed put, clinging to the dwindling hope that it would all just go away. But as the hours passed and the fire burned low, my fear only grew stronger. Every shadow seemed to take on a life of its own, every rustle of leaves a potential threat. I didn't sleep that night, too afraid of what might happen if I let my guard down even for a moment. I sat by the fire, my eyes trained on the darkness, waiting for dawn to break and the nightmare to end. And then, finally, the first light of dawn began to creep over the horizon, casting long shadows across the forest floor. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that I had made it through the night in one piece. But as I began to pack up my things and prepare to leave, I heard it again, that same guttural growl, closer this time followed by the sound of heavy footsteps crunching through the underbrush. I turned to see a figure emerging from the trees, shrouded in darkness and moving with an unnatural grace that sent alarm bells ringing in my head. I didn't wait around to see what it was. I grabbed my pack and ran, sprinting through the forest as fast as my legs would carry me, desperate to escape whatever lurked behind me. I didn't stop running until I reached the safety of my car heart pounding in my chest and lungs burning with exertion. And as I drove away from the cursed campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something truly sinister, something that lurked in the darkness and watched me with hungry eyes. I never went camping alone again, haunted by the memory of that night and the terrifying realization that I was now alone in the wilderness. It started innocently enough. I'm a contractor, and I'd bought this old fixer-upper with grand plans to renovate it into a beautiful home. The house was old, sure, but it had character, the kind you just can't find in newer builds. So, armed with my tools and enthusiasm, I dove headfirst into the renovations. At first, everything seemed normal. I tore down walls, ripped up old carpet, and pulled out outdated fixtures, all in the hopes of breathing new life into the old house. But as I worked, I started to notice strange things, little details that didn't quite add up. It started with the walls. As I tore away the drywall, I found strange markings etched into the plaster beneath. They were crude, almost like someone had carved them with their fingernails, and they seemed to form some kind of pattern though I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I tried to shrug it off as nothing, just the remnants of some previous owner's eccentricity, perhaps. But as I continued to work, I found more and more strange things hidden within the house's structure. One day, as I was tearing out a section of flooring in the kitchen, my crowbar struck something solid beneath the floorboards. Curious, I pried up the boards and found myself staring down at a pile of bones, human bones. I recoiled in horror, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. Had someone been murdered in this house? And if so, how had their remains ended up buried beneath the floorboards? I called the police, of course, and they launched an investigation into the house's history. As it turned out, the house had a dark past, a history of violence and tragedy that stretched back decades. Apparently, the previous owner had been a recluse, a man who had lived alone in the house for years, shunning contact with the outside world. And as the police dug deeper, they uncovered evidence of unspeakable horrors hidden within the walls of the old house. 
It seemed that the recluse had been a serial killer, a man who had lured unsuspecting victims to their deaths within the confines of the old house. And as the police excavated the property, they found more and more evidence of his crimes, hidden chambers beneath the floorboards filled with the remains of his victims. I was sickened by what I saw, by the thought that I had been living and working in a house that had been the scene of such horrors. But as the police continued their investigation, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was still something lurking within the old house, something dark and sinister, waiting to be uncovered. In the end, the police never found any evidence of other bodies buried on the property, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was still something lurking within the walls of the old house, something that refused to be forgotten. I finished the renovations as quickly as I could, eager to put the horrors of the past behind me and move on with my life. But no matter where I went or what I did, I couldn't shake the feeling that the old house was still watching me. So, me and my friends decided to go camping last weekend. We figured it'd be a fun way to get away from the stress of everyday life and reconnect with nature. But let me tell you, things didn't exactly go according to plan. The first night, everything seemed normal enough. We set up our tents, built a fire, roasted some marshmallows, the usual camping stuff. But as the night wore on, I started to feel like we were being watched. I couldn't shake the feeling that there were eyes on us, lurking in the darkness just beyond the edge of the firelight. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination running wild, but the feeling only grew stronger as the night went on. And then, just as we were all getting ready to turn in for the night, I caught a glimpse of something moving in the trees. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light, but then I saw it again, a shadowy figure, lurking just beyond the reach of the fire. I tried to point it out to my friends, but by the time they turned to look, it was gone. We all laughed it off, chalking it up to nerves in too many horror movies, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I lay awake for hours, listening to the sounds of the forest and trying to convince myself that it was all in my head. But the next night, the figures were back, and this time, they were closer. I could see them moving through the trees their shapes distorted and twisted in the darkness. I tried to wake my friends up to show them, but they just grumbled and rolled over, too tired to care. I felt a growing sense of unease as the figures drew closer, their intentions still unknown. I knew we needed to get out of there, but I also knew that we were miles away from the nearest town, with no way to call for help. I tried to convince myself that it was just a prank, some local kids messing with us for fun, but deep down, I knew that wasn't true. There was something about those figures that didn't feel human, something dark and sinister lurking just beneath the surface. As the night wore on, the figures drew closer and closer, until they were just beyond the edge of the firelight. I could hear them whispering to each other, their voices low and guttural, sending shivers down my spine. I knew we couldn't stay there any longer, we had to get out of there, no matter what. So, as soon as dawn broke, I woke my friends up and told them we needed to pack up and leave. They crumbled and complained, but I could see the fear in their eyes, too. We packed up our gear as quickly as we could and made a break for it, running through the woods as fast as our legs would carry us. I didn't dare look back, afraid of what I might see lurking in the shadows behind us. We made it back to civilization in one piece, but I'll never forget the terror of those nights in the woods, or the feeling of being hunted by something I couldn't see or understand. I don't know what those figures were or what they wanted, but I know one thing for sure, I'll never go camping in those woods again. It was just another day on the job for me, Emily, a volunteer search and rescue worker always ready to answer the call for help. When the distress call came in from a stranded hiker in the remote wilderness, I didn't hesitate to spring into action.
gathering my team, we wasted no time in heading out to locate the hiker and bring them to safety. The sense of urgency hung heavy in the air as we navigated the rugged terrain, our eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of the lost soul we were tasked with rescuing. But as we delved deeper into the heart of the wilderness, a feeling of unease settled over me. The silence of the forest seemed to press in on us, and I couldn't shake the sense that we were being watched by unseen eyes. As we pressed on, following the coordinates provided by the hiker's distress call, the tension in the air grew thicker with each passing moment. It was as if the very forest itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. And then, we stumbled upon it, a clearing in the woods that seemed to pulse with an eerie energy. It was there that we found the hiker, cowering in fear as if they had seen something beyond comprehension. But before we could react, a shadowy figure emerged from the trees, a lone man with wild eyes and a haunted expression. He warned us to turn back, to leave the forest and never return, but something in his voice told me that there was more to his warning than met the eye. Ignoring his pleas, we pressed on, determined to fulfill our duty and bring the hiker to safety. But as we ventured deeper into the woods, we soon realized that we were not alone. Strange noises echoed through the trees, and the feeling of being watched grew stronger with each step we took. It was as if the very forest itself had come alive, its ancient secrets awakening to confront us. And then, just as we thought things couldn't get any worse, we stumbled upon a clearing filled with makeshift shrines and symbols carved into the earth. It was a chilling sight, one that spoke of dark rituals and unspeakable horrors lurking just beyond the edge of our vision. As we surveyed the scene, a sense of dread settled over me like a heavy blanket. We were in over our heads, facing an enemy far more dangerous than we had ever imagined. But there was no turning back now. With the hiker's life hanging in the balance, we pressed on, determined to uncover the truth behind the dark secrets of the forest. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, the sense of unease grew stronger with each passing moment. It was as if the very air was alive with malevolent intent, waiting to ensnare us in its deadly embrace. And then, just when we thought things couldn't get any worse, we stumbled upon a hidden cave hidden deep within the heart of the forest. It was there that we found the source of the darkness, a group of men and women gathered around a flickering fire, their faces twisted with madness as they chanted in an ancient language. With horror, we realized that we had stumbled upon a cult, a group of fanatics who worshipped the dark forces that lurked in the depths of the forest. And as they turned their attention towards us, we knew that our worst nightmares were about to come true. In a desperate bid for survival, we fought back against the cultists, using every ounce of strength and skill we possessed to fend off their relentless attacks. But they were relentless, driven by a madness that knew no bounds. Just when it seemed that all hope was lost, a miracle occurred. With a roar of engines, a team of reinforcements arrived on the scene, driving back the cultists and rescuing us from certain doom. As we made our way back to civilization, battered and bruised but alive, I couldn't help but reflect on the horrors we had witnessed in the heart of the wilderness. It was a reminder that evil can lurk in the most unexpected of places, waiting to ensnare the unwary in its deadly embrace. So, me and my friends, we decide to go camping in the woods near this remote lake for a weekend getaway. We're all excited, looking forward to some time away from the hustle and bustle of city life. But then, things take a turn for the worse. We're sitting around the campfire one night, laughing and joking, when someone gets the bright idea to play a prank on one of our friends. We figure it'll be harmless fun, you know? Just a little scared to liven things up. So, we hatch a plan to pretend to be attacked by a wild animal, thinking it'll be a good laugh. But then, the prank goes horribly wrong. We're out in the woods, pretending to be chased by this imaginary beast, when suddenly, something grabs me from behind. At first, I think it's just one of my friends playing along with the prank. But when I turn around, 
I see the fear in their eyes, the terror on their faces. And that's when I realize, it's not one of my friends. It's something else, something real. I try to scream, to fight back, but it's like I'm frozen in place. All I can do is watch in horror as this thing drags me deeper into the darkness of the woods. I can hear my friends calling out for me, their voices filled with panic and desperation. But I know it's no use. Whatever this thing is, it's got me now. I try to struggle, to break free from its grasp. But it's like trying to fight against a force of nature, something primal and unstoppable. And then, just when I think all hope is lost, I see a glimmer of light up ahead. It's my friends, coming to rescue me. They charge at the thing, driving it back into the shadows with makeshift weapons and sheer determination. And somehow, against all odds, they manage to pull me free from its clutches. We run as fast as we can, back to the safety of our campsite, our hearts pounding in our chests. But even as we catch our breath, we know we're not out of the woods yet. We can still hear it out there, lurking in the darkness, waiting for its next chance to strike. But we refuse to let fear paralyze us. We stick together, keeping a watchful eye on the surrounding woods as we wait for morning to come. And when the sun finally rises, we pack up our things and get the hell out of there, vowing never to return to those woods again. It's a terrifying experience, one that will haunt me for the rest of my days. But I'm grateful to be alive, grateful for the friends who risked their lives to save me from that thing in the darkness. And as we drive away from those woods, I can't help but wonder, what else is out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its chance to strike? But for now, all I can do is focus on getting as far away from those woods as possible, and praying that whatever the thing was, it never finds us again. It was just like any other night at the shopping mall where I work as a janitor. The place was quiet, the only sounds echoing through the empty corridors were the hum of fluorescent lights and the faint buzz of the security cameras. As I made my rounds, sweeping the floors and emptying the trash cans, I noticed something strange, a trail of blood leading from the parking lot to the back entrance of the building. At first, I thought it must be some kind of prank or accident, but as I followed the trail, my heart began to pound in my chest with growing unease. The blood trail led me deeper into the building, twisting and turning through the maze-like corridors until it came to an abrupt end in front of a maintenance closet. My hand shook as I reached for the door handle, my mind racing with horrifying possibilities of what I might find on the other side. But I couldn't turn back now. With a deep breath, I pushed open the door and stepped inside, bracing myself for the worst. What I saw inside the maintenance closet made my blood run cold. There, lying on the floor in a pool of blood, was a body, a man, his face contorted in agony, his eyes wide with fear. I stumbled back in shock, my mind reeling as I tried to process what I was seeing. It was clear that this was no accident, someone had been brutally attacked, and the perpetrator was still out there, somewhere in the building. My first instinct was to call the police, but as I reached for my phone, a noise behind me made me freeze in place. Turning slowly, I saw a shadowy figure lurking in the darkness, their eyes gleaming with malice as they stared back at me. My heart pounding in my chest, I knew I had to get out of there, and fast. With trembling hands, I backed away from the closet, my eyes never leaving the figure in front of me. But as I turned to run, I felt something grab hold of my ankle, sending me sprawling to the ground with a cry of pain. I struggled to break free kicking and thrashing against my unseen assailant as I fought for my life. But the figure was relentless, their grip like a vice as they dragged me back towards the maintenance closet. With every ounce of strength I had left, I screamed for help, praying that someone, anyone, would hear me and come to my rescue. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, I heard the sound of footsteps echoing through the corridor. With a surge of adrenaline, I redoubled my efforts, 
kicking and screaming with renewed fervor as the footsteps drew nearer. And then, just as the figure was about to drag me into the darkness of the maintenance closet, a beam of light pierced the darkness, illuminating the corridor in front of me. It was the security guard, his face a mask of concern as he rushed towards me, his hand outstretched to help me to my feet. Together, we fled from the maintenance closet, racing through the corridors of the shopping mall as we called out for help. And then, finally, we burst through the back entrance of the building, stumbling out into the parking lot where the night air was cool and crisp. As we waited for the police to arrive, I couldn't shake the feeling of horror that gripped me. The memory of what I had seen in that maintenance closet burned into my mind like a brand. But despite the terror I had endured, I was alive, and for that, I was grateful. Grateful to the security guard who had come to my rescue. It was supposed to be a weekend of relaxation, just me, my tent, and the great outdoors. I had been looking forward to it for weeks, a chance to escape the stresses of everyday life and reconnect with nature. But as I set up camp in a remote clearing deep in the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right. The forest seemed unnaturally quiet, devoid of the usual sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. And as night fell and the darkness closed in around me, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled over me like a thick fog. But I brushed it off as just my imagination playing tricks on me, and settled down for the night, hoping that a good night's sleep would banish my fears once and for all. But as I drifted off into slumber, I was suddenly jolted awake by the sound of snapping twigs and heavy footsteps outside my tent. My heart pounding in my chest, I lay there in the darkness, listening intently as the footsteps drew closer and closer. And then, just when I thought I couldn't bear it any longer, they stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that seemed to stretch on for an eternity. I lay there, frozen in fear, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But there was nothing, no sound, no movement, nothing to indicate that anyone or anything was out there in the darkness. But just as I was beginning to relax and convince myself that it had all been a figment of my imagination, I heard it, a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. It was unlike anything I had ever heard before, primal and menacing, like the growl of some wild animal stalking its prey. I knew then that I was not alone in the woods, that there was something out there, something hungry, and dangerous, and very, very real. And as the growling grew louder and more insistent, I realized with a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach that I was its target. With trembling hands, I fumbled for my flashlight and switched it on, casting a feeble beam of light into the darkness outside. And what I saw there made my blood run cold, a pair of eyes, glowing with an otherworldly intensity, staring back at me from the shadows. I knew then that I had to get out of there, and fast. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I tore open the flap of my tent and bolted into the night, running as fast as my legs would carry me, guided only by the beam of my flashlight and the sound of my pounding heart. But no matter how fast I ran, I couldn't seem to shake the feeling that I was being pursued, that unseen eyes were watching my every move, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And then, just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I stumbled upon something that made my blood run cold. Hidden among the trees was a crude shack, its walls constructed from branches and its roof from tattered pieces of canvas. And standing in the doorway, illuminated by the beam of my flashlight, was the source of the growling, a man, or something that used to be a man, with wild eyes and a feral grin. I knew then that I had stumbled upon something truly terrifying, a wilderness cannibal, living off the land and hunting unsuspecting travelers like myself. And as he lunged towards me, his hands outstretched and his teeth bared in a hungry grin, I knew that my worst nightmares had come true. But I refused to go down without a fight. With a scream of terror, I turned and fled into the darkness, ducking and weaving between the trees as the cannibal pursued me with single-minded determination. And then, just when I thought all hope was lost, 
I saw it, a faint glow in the distance, the telltale sign of civilization. With renewed hope, I pushed myself harder and harder, my lungs burning and my legs aching with exertion. And then, just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I burst through the trees and stumbled into the clearing, gasping for breath and trembling with exhaustion. But I was safe, somehow, miraculously, safe. And as I collapsed to the ground, surrounded by the comforting glow of streetlights and the sounds of cars passing by, I knew that I would never venture into the wilderness again, not for all the world. We were out in the middle of nowhere, just me and my friends, ready for a weekend of camping and relaxation. We found a remote spot, far away from civilization, where we could truly immerse ourselves in nature. As we set up our tents and got a fire going, everything seemed perfect. The air was crisp, the stars were shining brightly overhead, and we were all looking forward to a few days of peace and quiet. But as night fell and darkness descended upon the forest, things started to take a turn for the worse. We began to hear strange noises coming from the woods, rustling in the underbrush, snapping twigs, and lo, guttural growls that sent shivers down our spines. At first, we tried to brush it off, convincing ourselves that it was just the normal sounds of the wilderness. But as the noises grew louder and closer, we couldn't ignore the feeling of unease that settled over us like a heavy blanket. We huddled together around the fire, our eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. But the shadows seemed to swallow everything up, leaving us feeling vulnerable and exposed. Suddenly, there was a loud crash from the bushes nearby, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps crunching through the undergrowth. We froze, our hearts pounding in our chests as we waited for whatever was out there to reveal itself. And then, emerging from the darkness, came a figure, tall and menacing, with wild eyes and a feral grin that sent chills down our spines. It was a man, but there was something about him that seemed, off. He staggered towards us, his movements unsteady and erratic, like a predator sizing up its prey. We scrambled to our feet, ready to run, but he just stood there, watching us with a hungry look in his eyes. I could feel the panic rising in my chest as I searched desperately for a way out. But no matter which direction I looked, all I could see were trees and darkness stretching out into infinity. And then, just as suddenly as he had appeared, the man turned and disappeared back into the forest, leaving us alone once again. But the sense of dread lingered, like a dark cloud hanging over our heads, reminding us that we were not safe out here in the wilderness. We spent the rest of the night huddled together, our ears straining for any sign of danger. But aside from the occasional rustle of leaves or distant howl of a wild animal, the woods remained eerily quiet. As dawn broke and the first light of morning filtered through the trees, we wasted no time packing up our camp and getting the hell out of there. We didn't stop until we were back in the safety of civilization, far away from the remote wilderness that had almost become our tomb. Looking back on that night, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if we had stayed just a little longer. Would the man have returned, more aggressive and dangerous than before? Or would we have become just another set of bones littering the forest floor, victims of whatever lurked in the darkness? I may never know the answers to those questions, but one thing is for certain, I will never underestimate the dangers of the wilderness again. It was one of those chilly winter nights, the kind where the cold seeps into your bones and makes you shiver no matter how many layers you're wearing. We were a group of friends, six of us in total, heading out to the woods for a camping trip over the weekend. It seemed like the perfect way to escape the stresses of everyday life and unwind amidst nature's beauty. As we set up our tents and gathered around the campfire, everything felt peaceful and serene. The crackling of the fire and the sound of the wind rustling through the trees created a comforting backdrop to our conversations and laughter. We roasted marshmallows, exchanged stories, 
and enjoyed each other's company under the starry night sky. But as darkness descended upon the forest, things started to take a sinister turn. It began with faint, distant screams echoing through the trees. At first, we tried to brush them off as the wind playing tricks on our ears or perhaps the calls of some nocturnal animals. However, the screams grew louder and more frequent, sending a chill down our spines. They sounded human, filled with fear and agony, and seemed to be getting closer with each passing moment. We exchanged nervous glances, the jovial atmosphere of our camping trip quickly evaporating into unease. Despite our growing apprehension, we tried to convince ourselves that there must be a rational explanation for the screams. Maybe someone else was camping nearby and needed help, or perhaps it was just a group of rowdy teenagers playing pranks in the woods. But deep down, we all knew that something wasn't right. The screams sounded too raw, too desperate to be anything ordinary. A sense of dread settled over our campsite, casting a shadow over the flickering flames of our fire. As the night wore on, the screams grew louder and more frantic, mingling with the howling of the wind to create an eerie symphony of terror. We huddled closer together, our nerves stretched to the breaking point as we strained our ears for any clue as to what was happening in the darkness beyond our campsite. Suddenly, one of our friends pointed towards the edge of the clearing, her voice trembling with fear. Through the dense thicket of trees, we caught a glimpse of something moving, a shadowy figure darting between the trunks with unnatural speed. Panic surged through our group, and we scrambled to douse the fire and retreat into our tents, hoping to conceal ourselves from whatever lurked in the darkness outside. But even as we huddled together, trying to block out the terrifying sounds of the forest, we knew that we were not safe. The screams grew louder and more frenzied, echoing through the trees like a haunting chorus of the damned. It was as though the very air around us was alive with fear and despair, suffocating us with its oppressive weight. Hours passed in agonizing silence, each minute feeling like an eternity as we waited for dawn to break and release us from the grip of terror. But when morning finally came, it brought no relief, only the grim realization that we were not alone in the wilderness. As we emerged from our tents, bleary-eyed and shaken, we discovered signs of a struggle scattered throughout the campsite, broken branches, trampled undergrowth, and deep gouges in the earth. It was clear that something had been hunting us during the night, lurking in the shadows just beyond the reach of our campfire's light. Terrified and desperate to escape, we packed up our belongings as quickly as we could, casting anxious glances over our shoulders with every rustle of leaves and snap of twigs. We knew that we had to get out of the forest before whatever had been stalking us returned for another hunt. With trembling hands and racing hearts, we stumbled through the underbrush, following the trail back to civilization with a sense of urgency bordering on panic. The screams still echoed in our ears, a haunting reminder of the horrors we had witnessed in the depths of the wilderness. But despite our fear and exhaustion, we pressed on, driven by the primal instinct to survive. And as we finally emerged from the forest, blinking in the harsh light of day, we knew that we had escaped the clutches of whatever malevolent force had been lurking in the darkness. My name is Stuart, friends call me Stu. I'm just a custodian at the university, you know, doing my rounds, cleaning up after the students and all that. It's a pretty straightforward job most of the time, but one night, things got weird. I was down in the basement of the library, mopping the floors and taking out the trash, when I noticed something strange a door that I'd never seen before. It was tucked away in a corner, hidden behind a stack of old crates. Curiosity got the better of me, so I decided to take a look. I opened the door and stepped inside, my flashlight cutting through the darkness like a beacon. What I found inside was, well, it was like something out of a horror movie. The room was filled with dusty old books, piled high on shelves that stretched up to the ceiling. And all around the walls were these strange symbols, carved into the stone like they'd been there for centuries. 
I didn't know what to make of it at first, but the longer I stood there, the more uneasy I felt. There was something about the air in that room, something heavy and oppressive, like I was being watched by something I couldn't see. I tried to shake off the feeling and focus on my work, but every time I turned my back, I felt like something was breathing down my neck. It was like the shadows themselves were alive, moving and shifting in the darkness. I couldn't take it anymore, so I decided to get out of there. But just as I was about to leave, I heard something, a faint whispering sound, like someone speaking in a language I couldn't understand. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I strained to listen. It was coming from somewhere deep within the room, hidden in the shadows. I wanted to run, to get as far away from that room as possible, but something kept me rooted to the spot. It was like I was under some kind of spell, unable to move or look away. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, the whispering stopped. The room was silent once more, the only sound the pounding of my own heartbeat. I took that as my cue to leave, and I practically ran out of there, my heart racing and my hands shaking. I didn't stop until I was safely back upstairs, far away from that cursed room. I tried to tell my supervisor about what I'd found, but he just brushed it off like it was nothing. He said it was probably just some old storage room or something, and that I shouldn't worry about it. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something dark and sinister lurking in the depths of that basement. And I made a promise to myself that I would never go back down there again. The small town I moved to for my new job seemed idyllic at first glance. But as I settled into my role as the town doctor, I began to notice strange things, patients with unexplainable mutations, rumors of dark experiments conducted by my predecessor, Dr. Matthews. I couldn't ignore the signs any longer. There was something sinister lurking beneath the surface of this seemingly peaceful town, and I was determined to uncover the truth. My investigation led me to Dr. Matthews' old office, where I discovered a trove of research notes detailing his experiments. It was horrifying, he had been tampering with the very fabric of life itself, conducting twisted experiments on the townspeople in a quest for power and control. As I delved deeper into Dr. Matthews' research, I realized the extent of the damage he had caused. The mutations plaguing the townspeople were not random occurrences, they were the result of his dark experiments gone awry. But worse still, I discovered evidence that the mutations were spreading, infecting more and more of the townspeople with each passing day. If I didn't find a way to stop them soon, the entire town would be consumed by madness. Armed with this knowledge, I knew I had to act fast. But the question remained, how could I stop something so insidious, so pervasive? My answer came in the form of a serum I discovered in Dr. Matthews' lab, a serum designed to reverse the effects of his experiments and restore the townspeople to their former selves. It was a long shot, but it was the only hope we had. With the serum in hand, I set out to administer it to the affected townspeople, racing against time to stop the mutations from spreading any further. It was a race against time, and failure was not an option. As I went from house to house, injecting the serum into the veins of the afflicted, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that hung over me like a dark cloud. What if it didn't work? What if I was too late? But despite my fears, I pressed on, driven by the knowledge that I was the only one who could stop the madness consuming the town. And slowly but surely, I began to see signs of progress, the mutations receding, the townspeople returning to normal. But just as I began to breathe a sigh of relief, I heard a voice behind me, a soft, rasping voice that sent shivers down my spine. It was Dr. Matthews, his face twisted in a grotesque parody of a smile. You can't stop it, he whispered, his voice dripping with malice. It's already too late. The experiments have already taken root, and soon the entire town will be consumed by darkness. I recoiled in horror, realizing the truth of his words. 
The mutations were not the result of some failed experiment, they were a curse, a curse that had been unleashed upon the town by Dr. Matthews himself. But I refused to give up hope. Armed with the serum and the knowledge of Dr. Matthews' true intentions, I redoubled my efforts to save the town from destruction. And slowly but surely, my efforts began to pay off. The mutations receded, the townspeople returned to normal, and the darkness that had threatened to consume us all was banished once and for all. In the end, I emerged victorious, but the memory of those dark days will haunt me forever. The town may have been saved, but the scars of Dr. Matthews' experiments will linger for years to come. It was a typical night as I drove home from work, the streets quiet and deserted. But as I glanced in my rearview mirror, I noticed a car following closely behind me, its headlights piercing the darkness. At first, I didn't think much of it, assuming it was just another driver headed in the same direction. But as I turned onto side streets and took detours in an attempt to lose the car, I realized that it wasn't just coincidence, the car was following me deliberately matching my every move. Panic began to rise in my chest as I tried to make sense of the situation, my mind racing with possibilities. I considered calling the police, but something held me back, a nagging fear that doing so would only escalate the situation further. And so, I continued to drive, my heart pounding in my chest as I searched for a way out of this terrifying predicament. But no matter where I turned, the car was always there its presence like a dark shadow looming over me. It was as if the driver was playing a twisted game of cat and mouse, toying with me for their own amusement. As the minutes stretched into hours, I grew more and more desperate, my thoughts consumed by the need to escape from this relentless pursuit. But no matter how fast I drove or how many turns I made, the car was always right behind me, its headlights glaring in my rearview mirror like accusing eyes. I tried to remain calm, to think rationally about what to do next, but fear clouded my judgment, leaving me paralyzed with indecision. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, the car pulled alongside me, the driver's face hidden in the darkness. For a moment, we locked eyes, a silent understanding passing between us, a recognition of the danger we both faced. And then, without warning, the driver swerved in front of me forcing me to slam on the brakes to avoid a collision. I watched in horror as the car disappeared into the night, leaving me shaken and alone on the deserted road. My heart raced as I tried to make sense of what had just happened, the adrenaline coursing through my veins as I struggled to regain control of my emotions. But even as I tried to convince myself that it was over, that I was safe at last, a nagging feeling of unease lingered in the back of my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that the driver was still out there, watching and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And so, with a sense of dread weighing heavy on my heart, I continued on my journey home, the memory of that terrifying encounter etched into my mind forever. But as I pulled into my driveway and stepped out of the car, a wave of relief washed over me, relief that I had survived the nightmarish ordeal, that I had outwitted my would-be attacker and escaped with my life. As I locked the door behind me and stepped into the safety of my home, I realized I was now safe. I'll never forget the day my partner and I stumbled upon something straight out of a nightmare. It was just another road trip, cruising down a lonely stretch of highway in the middle of nowhere. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the empty road as we chatted and listened to music. But then, out of nowhere, we heard it. A faint crackle over the radio, followed by a desperate voice pleading for help. It was a distress call from a stranded motorist, their voice filled with panic and fear. My partner and I exchanged a glance, our instincts kicking in as we realized we couldn't just ignore someone in trouble. We decided to investigate, hoping we could lend a hand and maybe even save a life. As we drove toward the source of the distress call, the road grew increasingly desolate. 
The sun dipped below the horizon, leaving us shrouded in darkness as we navigated the winding roads. Eventually, we spotted a car up ahead, its hazard lights flashing in the gloom. We pulled up alongside it, our hearts pounding in our chests as we prepared to offer assistance. But as we approached, something felt off. The car looked abandoned, its doors hanging open and its engine silent. There was no sign of the motorist who had sent out the distress call. My partner and I shared a nervous glance, the hairs on the back of our necks standing on end as we realized we might have walked right into a trap. Just then, we heard the sound of footsteps approaching from the darkness. We whirled around to see a group of figures emerging from the shadows, their faces twisted into grotesque masks of malice. Panic surged through me as I realized we were outnumbered and outgunned. My partner and I exchanged a silent nod, our only hope of survival resting on our ability to think and act quickly. But before we could make a move, the group descended upon us with terrifying speed and ferocity. They dragged us from our car, their hands like iron grips around our arms as they forced us to our knees. I felt a surge of adrenaline as I struggled against their hold, my mind racing as I searched for a way out of this nightmare. But no matter how hard I fought, I couldn't break free from their grasp. Suddenly, one of the figures stepped forward, their face hidden behind a sinister mask adorned with jagged edges and twisted features. They brandished a knife, its blade gleaming in the moonlight as they advanced toward us with slow, deliberate steps. My heart pounded in my chest as I braced myself for the worst, my mind racing with fear and desperation. But just as the figure raised the knife, a sudden burst of noise echoed through the night. It was the sound of approaching sirens, growing louder and louder with each passing moment. The group faltered, their grip loosening as they glanced nervously at one another. In that split second of hesitation, my partner and I seized our chance. We broke free from their hold and sprinted toward our car, adrenaline coursing through our veins as we raced to safety. As we sped away from the scene, the flashing lights of the approaching police cars filled me with a sense of relief and gratitude. We had escaped with our lives, but the memory of that night would haunt me forever. To this day, I can't shake the feeling of terror that washed over me in those dark moments. We decided to go camping in a remote forest, we were excited for the chance to immerse ourselves in nature and create memories that would last a lifetime. As we trekked deeper into the woods, the trees grew thicker, and the air grew still, casting an eerie silence over the forest. But we pressed on, eager to find the perfect spot to set up camp and begin our adventure. But as we pitched our tents and gathered firewood, we failed to notice the signs warning us that we were trespassing on private land. It wasn't until we were approached by a group of angry locals that we realized our mistake. At first, we tried to reason with them, explaining that we had no intention of causing any harm and offering to leave immediately. But our pleas fell on deaf ears, and the locals grew increasingly hostile, their anger boiling over into threats of violence. Terrified, we scrambled to pack up our camp and make a hasty retreat, but it was too late. The locals had already descended upon us, their faces contorted with rage as they chased us through the forest, their shouts echoing through the trees like a death knell. As we ran, our hearts pounding in our chests, we could hear the sounds of pursuit growing closer and closer, the branches snapping underfoot and the leaves rustling as our pursuers closed in on us. We ran until our lungs burned and our legs felt like lead, but still, they pursued us, their relentless pursuit driving us deeper into the heart of the forest, where the trees grew thicker and the shadows deeper. At last, when we could run no more, we stumbled upon a clearing, the moonlight filtering through the trees and casting an ethereal glow over the scene. But our relief was short-lived, for we soon realized that we were trapped, surrounded on all sides by our vengeful pursuers. With nowhere left to run and our backs against the wall, we knew that we had only one choice, to fight for our lives. And so, we banded together, our hearts filled with fear and determination as we prepared to face our attackers head-on. 
The battle that ensued was brutal and bloody, a desperate struggle for survival as we fought tooth and nail against our assailants, our fists and weapons clashing in the moonlight as we fought for our very lives. But despite our best efforts, we were outnumbered and outmatched, our attackers relentless in their pursuit of vengeance. And in the chaos of battle, one of our own fell, injured and bleeding, a casualty of the brutal conflict. With our comrade injured and our forces dwindling, we knew that we had no choice but to retreat, to flee into the darkness and seek help before it was too late. And so, with heavy hearts and spirits broken, we turned and ran, leaving behind the scene of our bloody battle as we fought to escape with our lives. I'm an outdoor enthusiast, and I love nothing more than spending time in nature with my friends. So when we decided to go camping in a remote forest, I was thrilled. We packed our gear and set out for the wilderness, eager for an adventure. The first few days of our camping trip were idyllic. We hiked through the forest, swam in the rivers, and roasted marshmallows over the campfire. But then, on the third day, disaster struck. As we sat around the fire, enjoying the warmth of the flames, we noticed a strange smell in the air. It was acrid and smoky, like burning wood. We looked around, confused, and that's when we saw it. A plume of smoke was rising up from the trees in the distance, thick and black against the blue sky. Panic surged through me as I realized what was happening. A forest fire. We scrambled to gather our belongings and make a plan. But as we tried to flee, we realized that the fire had surrounded us, cutting off our escape route. With no other option, we plunged into the burning landscape, the heat searing our skin and the smoke stinging our eyes. I could feel the flames licking at my heels as I ran, pushing myself to keep going despite the pain. But as we fled, we realized that we were not alone. Something was stalking us through the smoke and flames, something dark and sinister. I caught glimpses of figures moving in the shadows, their eyes glowing with malice. They seemed to be toying with us, hurting us deeper into the inferno with each passing moment. Fear gripped me as I realized that we were being pursued by an unknown threat, something far more dangerous than the fire itself. But I refused to give up. I pushed myself to run faster to outpace whatever was chasing us. As we ran, we stumbled upon a clearing in the forest, a small patch of untouched land surrounded by flames. It was our only chance to catch our breath and regroup. But as we huddled together, catching our breath, we heard it. A low, guttural growl echoing through the trees. Whatever was chasing us had found us. With a sense of dread, we realized that we were trapped with nowhere to run and no means of defending ourselves. We were at the mercy of whatever lurked in the darkness. But then, just when all hope seemed lost, we heard the sound of helicopters overhead. Search and rescue teams had come to our aid, their bright lights cutting through the smoke and flames. With a sense of relief, we followed the sound of their voices, emerging from the forest battered and bruised but alive. We had survived the fire, and whatever had been chasing us through the night. I signed up for trucking school out in the Great Plains, thinking it was my ticket to a new life. The ad said they'd teach me everything about the open road, the rigs, and the freedom of the highway. Little did I know, it was more like signing up for a descent into darkness. First day, I walked into the place. Dingy walls, flickering lights, a whole deal. The instructor, a grizzled guy with a permanent scowl, started off normal enough. Welcome to the school, he said, eyeing us like we were fresh meat. He had this vibe, you know, something off about him, 
but I chalked it up to the stress of the job. Weeks went by, and the lessons seemed okay at first. We were learning to shift gears, handle the big rigs, the basics. But then, things started getting weird. He'd throw in these random emergency scenarios, like what to do if a car swerved in front of you or if your brakes failed. I mean, we were just beginners, not seasoned drivers. One day, after the usual lectures, he called me over. You've got potential, he said with a smirk. I didn't know whether to take it as a compliment or a warning. That's when he told me about the special lessons for those with promise. Curiosity got the better of me. What was supposed to be a regular driving lesson turned into something straight out of a nightmare. He'd take me to these isolated roads, far from prying eyes. No other students, just me and him in that big rig. The first time, he asked me to pull over in the middle of nowhere. He said he needed to check the engine or some crap. I'm sitting there, clueless, when I notice him eyeing me differently. It felt wrong, like I was prey in the sights of a predator. He started asking personal questions, things that had nothing to do with trucking. My gut told me to get out of there, but I didn't want to fail. Next thing I knew, he handed me a package and said it needed to be delivered ASAP. No company markings, no details, just a vague address and a sense of unease. As I drove, that package weighed heavy on my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was mixed up in something I shouldn't be. The address led me to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. My nerves were shot, but I went inside. The place was pitch black, my footsteps echoing like whispers in the silence. That's when I saw them, shady figures lurking in the shadows. They wanted the package, no questions asked. I handed it over, trying to act like it was just another day on the job. The instructor's lessons turned into a series of increasingly dangerous runs. I felt like I was caught in a web, each delivery pulling me deeper into some criminal underworld. I tried telling the school, but they brushed it off, saying it was part of the training. I was on my own. One night, he took me to a remote area, far from any towns. The cargo this time was different, something he wouldn't even show me. Red flags flew, but I had no choice. As we approached the drop-off, a chill ran down my spine. It was a rendezvous with masked men in the dead of night. I overheard whispers about illegal goods, smuggling, and a network that stretched far beyond the trucking school. My heart pounded as the realization hit this wasn't just a shady instructor, it was a criminal operation. I knew I had to get out, but every attempt to quit ended with threats and intimidation. They made it clear I was in too deep, and there was no turning back. One night, I made a desperate move. While the instructor was occupied, I slipped away, leaving that trucking school nightmare behind. I drove through the night, haunted by the shadows of my ordeal. So, we moved to this small, quiet town in the southwest. Figured it'd be a fresh start for us. One day, we strolled down the main street, and there it was, a dusty old antique store. Looked like something out of a movie, with creaky wooden floors and shelves full of forgotten treasures. A sign in the window caught our eye, help wanted. My wife, always eager to find work, decided to give it a shot. The owner, Mr. Jennings, was an older guy with a perpetual scowl. He eyed her up and down, sizing her up like she was some commodity. But hey, a job was a job. First day on the job, my wife found herself surrounded by peculiar items. Old watches, faded paintings, and trinkets that carried the weight of time. The air in that store felt heavy, like each piece held a story, not all of them pleasant. As days passed, my wife started noticing strange things. Items seemed to come and go mysteriously, like they had a life of their own. She brushed it off at first, 
thinking maybe it was just the nature of an antique store. But then came the late nights. Mr. Jennings would have her stay behind, cataloging items in the dimly lit back room. The air felt colder there, and the shadows danced around her, whispering secrets that she couldn't quite make out. She started feeling uneasy, like she was caught in something she couldn't understand. Curiosity got the better of her. One night, she decided to dig a little deeper. She started snooping around, looking into Mr. Jennings' records. That's when she stumbled upon the truth, a dark truth. The antiques weren't just old, they were stolen. The store was a front for a much shadier operation. Terrified, she confronted Mr. Jennings. The air in that back room grew dense with tension. He didn't deny it, just looked at her with those cold eyes. It was as if the walls themselves were closing in on her. She demanded answers, asked him why he was dealing in stolen goods. Mr. Jennings chuckled, a sinister sound that sent shivers down her spine. He reveled in it, boasting about how easy it was to hide in plain sight, behind the facade of an antique store. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifted. The room felt darker, and the antiques seemed to come alive with malevolence. Mr. Jennings' smile turned into a twisted grin. He warned her not to interfere, telling her it was too late. The shadows, once mere observers, now felt like accomplices in some sinister game. My wife, fear etched on her face, knew she had to get out. She stumbled backward, making her way towards the door. But Mr. Jennings wasn't about to let her leave with her newfound knowledge. As she reached for the doorknob, he lunged at her, grabbing her arm with a grip that felt inhuman. Panic set in as she struggled to break free. The room seemed to warp around her, the walls closing in, and the shadows reaching out like malevolent tendrils. In a desperate move, she managed to break away, tearing open the door and fleeing into the night. The echoes of Mr. Jennings' laughter followed her, a haunting soundtrack to the chilling encounter she had just survived. We left that town in a hurry, the weight of its secrets too much for us to bear. I was just a high school teacher in this small southern town, minding my own business, when things took a dark turn. It all started innocently enough, with a new student, Emily, joining my class. She was quiet, kept to herself, and didn't stand out much. But soon, I noticed her demeanor changing, like she was constantly on edge. One day, after school, Emily hesitated before leaving my class. She looked scared, like she wanted to say something but couldn't find the words. I asked if everything was okay, and that's when she reluctantly spilled the beans. A man had been following her, showing up wherever she went, and she was terrified. I tried to calm her down, assuring her we'd figure things out. That night, I decided to do some investigating. I couldn't let a student live in fear. I checked the school records and found out the man who had been stalking Emily had just moved to town. His name was John, and he had no apparent reason to be obsessed with a high school girl. The next day, I kept an eye on Emily. It wasn't long before I spotted John lurking near the school. He wasn't a student or a parent, he had no business being there. My protective instincts kicked in, and I confronted him. John denied everything claiming he was new in town and just taking a walk. But there was something about his demeanor that set off alarm bells. I warned him to stay away from Emily, but the sinister glint in his eyes told me this wouldn't be the end of it. I reported the incident to the school and the local authorities, hoping they'd keep a close watch. Days passed, and Emily's fear didn't subside. If anything, it intensified. She told me about strange messages she'd received, ominous notes left in her locker. It was like this guy was toying with her, enjoying the terror he was causing. I couldn't sit back and watch this unfold. I decided to keep a close eye on both Emily and John, 
a self-appointed guardian. The tension in the air was palpable. Emily was constantly on edge, and John seemed to revel in the psychological game he was playing. One evening, as Emily was leaving the school, I noticed John trailing her. I confronted him again, this time more forcefully. He tried to brush it off, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he was dangerous. I reported the incident to the police, but without concrete evidence, they could only issue a warning. As the weeks passed, the stalking escalated. Emily was getting threatening messages, and I started receiving anonymous calls, eerie whispers on the other end. It was like this guy was mocking me, letting me know he was always one step ahead. One night, as I was leaving school, I spotted John in the shadows. He didn't try to hide this time, he just stood there, a sinister grin on his face. I rushed towards him, anger boiling over, but he disappeared into the darkness. It was a game, and I was losing. I doubled down on my efforts to protect Emily. I urged her to stay vigilant, avoid being alone, and report anything unusual. The police were involved, but their hands were tied without concrete evidence of a crime. One day, Emily disappeared. She didn't show up for school, and her parents reported her missing. Panic set in. I couldn't shake the guilt, wondering if there was more I could have done. The town was in uproar, and the police launched a search. Days later, they found her. Emily was alive, but her spirit was broken. John had abducted her, subjected her to unspeakable horrors. The town was in shock, grappling with the realization that such darkness could exist within its borders. John was arrested, and Emily tried to piece her life back together, but the scars ran deep. The incident shook the entire community, a stark reminder that evil could manifest in the most unexpected places. Me and my buddies decided to rent this A-frame cabin in the Rockies. Thought it'd be a chill weekend, you know? Just some friends, good times, maybe a bit of skiing if the weather cooperated. But things took a turn, man, a dark turn. We got there, and the cabin was pretty cool, rustic vibes, surrounded by snow-covered trees. We were stoked. Nights by the fireplace, beers, the whole deal. But then the storm hit. Snow started falling like crazy, trapping us inside. No biggie, we thought. We're here to relax anyway. As we're rummaging around, killing time, someone notices a weird hatch in the ceiling. Curiosity kicks in, and we decide to check out the attic. Old stuff up there, dusty and forgotten. And then we find this box of photographs, like a time capsule from hell. The pictures were creepy as hell, man. All black and white, showing people in old-fashioned clothes, but there was something off. Like, they weren't happy poses, more like forced smiles and distant gazes. One by one, we flip through the stack, and the unease settles in. The faces in those photographs were haunting. Some people looked scared, others like they were trying to escape the frame. But the worst part? The cabin. Recognized it from the pictures. The same walls we were standing in, but back then, it wasn't a weekend getaway, it was a nightmare. Turns out, years ago, messed up stuff happened here. Those photographs, they were like snapshots of the past, capturing the darkness that soaked into the cabin's timbers. The faces in the pictures, I can't shake him. It's like they're still here, in the shadows, watching. Nights became tense. Every creak, every sound outside, felt like a whisper from those old photographs. We're trying to brush it off, you know, make light of the situation, but it's hard when the air feels heavy with the weight of the past. The storm outside howls like some angry spirit, and here we are stuck with the ghosts in the attic. We try to push the unsettling vibes away, focus on games and laughter, but deep down, 
we're all feeling the cabin's history seeping into our fun. We start seeing things, shadows moving where there shouldn't be any. Footsteps in the hall, but when we check, no one's there. The photographs, they're like a curse, bringing the cabin's twisted past into our present. It's like reliving someone else's nightmare. One night, we hear whispers in the attic. Can't make out the words, but it's there, the eerie murmur that chills us to the bone. We decide to pack up, get out of there, but the storm's still raging outside, trapping us with the darkness in those pictures. The tension escalates. Arguments, fear, paranoia, it's like the cabin is playing mind games with us. We find ourselves drawn back to the attic, compelled to stare at those haunting photographs, each face telling a silent tale of suffering. Days blur into a nightmarish loop. We're stuck in this cabin, surrounded by the ghosts of a past we didn't ask for. The storm outside, the creaking of the walls, the weight of those photographs, it's too much. We can't escape the darkness that hangs over this place. Eventually, the storm clears, and we bolt out of there, leaving the A-frame cabin and its disturbing history behind. But the faces in those photographs, the echoes of that haunted weekend, they stick with us. We thought it would be a simple day of fun in the sun, you know? A break from reality, just me and my girl, renting jet skis in the Bahamas. What could go wrong in paradise? We picked up those flashy jet skis, all revved up and ready for some adrenaline. The turquoise water stretched before us, inviting and sparkling. The sun was scorching, and the beachgoers seemed to be having a blast. Little did we know, our day was about to take a drastic turn. We jetted off, the wind whipping through our hair. It felt like freedom, like living in a postcard. We cruised along, the water beneath us clear as crystal. But as we ventured farther from the crowded shores, the atmosphere shifted. In the distance, we spotted a group of boats huddled together, hidden in a cove. We figured it was just some locals having a private party. No harm in exploring, right? That's where we went wrong. As we approached, the jovial sounds of the beach faded, replaced by something more ominous. Men in shady attire darted between the boats, exchanging packages, furtive glances, you name it. Suddenly, our carefree adventure became a dance on the edge of danger. We tried to steer clear, but the coast entrance was narrow, and before we knew it, we were in the middle of something we shouldn't have been involved in. The atmosphere turned tense, electric with an unspoken threat. One of the guys noticed us, and his eyes locked onto ours like a predator spotting prey. My girl squeezed my hand, fear evident in her eyes. We were intruders in their secret world. As we tried to turn back, the ringleader approached, blocking our escape. He had this cold, piercing gaze that made my stomach churn. We were stuck, with nowhere to go but face the unknown. He didn't say much, just warned us to keep our mouths shut about what we stumbled upon. The implication was clear, cross us, and there'd be consequences. The tropical paradise we envisioned morphed into a hostile territory, and we were powerless against the underbelly of the island. We nodded in agreement, our jet skis now surrounded by these enigmatic figures. They let us go, but the ominous air lingered. We jetted back to the bustling beach, trying to shake off the encounter, but it clung to us like a stain. Our carefree day turned into a lesson about the hidden undercurrents beneath the surface of paradise. So, we, the family, thought it'd be a great idea to have a winter vacation at this fancy ski resort in Aspen, Colorado. You know, hit the slopes, enjoy the crisp mountain air. But, man, that place had more secrets than we bargained for. Everything started all cozy, 
checking into the swanky resort. We were pumped, ready for some family fun in the snow. But soon, things started getting weird. Accidents left and right all around the mountain. First, it was just little things, a loose railing, a slippery patch on the slope. We thought, eh, it's a ski resort, accidents happen. But then, it got worse. Ski equipment malfunctioning, sudden icy patches on well-groomed trails. It was like the mountain itself had it out for us. We tried reporting the accidents to the resort staff, but they brushed it off like we were overreacting. Just to run of bad luck, they said. But we felt it in our bones, you know? The cozy winter vacation turned into a paranoia-filled nightmare on the snowy slopes. One day, we found this narrow trail that wasn't on the map. Curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to explore. That's when things got really strange. The trail led to this secluded area, away from the main slopes. It felt like we stumbled upon the resort's dirty little secret. There, we saw the staff arguing, heated exchanges about something we couldn't quite catch. It was like they were hiding more than just ski accidents. As we listened in, it became clear there was some vendetta among the staff, and we accidentally walked right into the crossfire. The tension was thick, like you could cut it with a knife. Accusations flew, fingers pointed. It wasn't just about ski accidents, it was personal. Crutches and revenge brewing among the people we thought were there to ensure our safety. The family went back to our room, shaken by what we witnessed. The cozy resort now felt like a minefield, every step a potential disaster. We started questioning if we should even be there, caught in the middle of a dangerous game among the staff. As we hit the slopes the next day, the accidents escalated. It was like the staff had ramped up their vendetta, making it clear that we were not welcome. Ski lifts malfunctioned, paths were mysteriously blocked. It felt like we were being targeted, and the snowy paradise turned into a battleground. We tried to capture evidence of the incidents, thinking maybe the authorities could sort it out. But each time, our cameras malfunctioned or went missing. The staff was one step ahead, playing dirty in their dangerous game. The family argued about leaving, but we were determined to unveil the truth. As we delved deeper into the mystery, it became clear that the vendetta among the staff had roots in some unresolved conflict. The Winter Wonderland became a backdrop for a dangerous drama, and we were unwilling participants. One night, we overheard a heated conversation among the staff in the resort's lounge. It was like they were laying out their plan, plotting something big. Fear settled in as we realized we were in the crosshairs of their dangerous game. We reported everything to the resort management, but they dismissed it as paranoia. Accidents happen, they said. But we knew better. The vendetta among the staff escalated, and it felt like we were living in a suspenseful thriller rather than enjoying a winter vacation. The family decided it was time to leave, to escape the dangerous drama unfolding on the snowy slopes. As we packed our bags, we could feel the eyes of the staff on us, like shadows watching from the trees. The cozy resort turned into a place of danger, and our winter vacation became a tale of survival. We left Aspen, leaving behind the cold mountain air and the dangerous vendetta that lurked beneath the snowy surface. It was one of those nights, you know, when you feel like nothing's going to happen, but then everything changes. I'm an emergency plumber, so getting called out at 1am is not unusual. I got this call about a leak in an old house on the outskirts of town. The address was in a neighborhood I didn't know, and the GPS took me down this dark, winding road that seemed to go on forever. When I finally found the house, it looked like something out of a horror movie. The paint was peeling, the windows were dark, and the whole place had this eerie vibe. I grabbed my tools, took a deep breath, and knocked on the door. It creaked open slowly, 
and I was hit with a musty smell that made my skin crawl. Hello? I called out, but there was no answer. I stepped inside, and the floorboards groaned under my weight. The only light came from a flickering bulb in the hallway. I followed the sound of dripping water to the basement, and that's when I saw her. A woman was standing down there, her back to me, muttering something I couldn't quite make out. Ma'am, I'm here to fix the leak, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. She turned around, and her eyes were wild, like she hadn't slept in days. She had this haunted look, like she was carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders. She led me to the source of the leak, and as I worked, she just stood there, watching me with those intense eyes. It was unnerving, to say the least. I finished up, and when I turned to tell her it was all fixed, she was gone. I called out for her, but there was no response. I packed up my tools and headed back upstairs, but the front door was locked. I tried to stay calm, but the situation was getting to me. I called out again, but there was only silence. Then, I heard a whisper, so faint I almost missed it. You shouldn't have come here. I spun around, but there was no one there. The air felt heavy, like something was pressing down on my chest. I fumbled with the lock, my heart pounding in my ears. Finally, the door gave way, and I stumbled out into the night. I didn't look back, just got in my van and drove as fast as I could. The whole way home, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something terrible. To this day, I don't know what really happened in that house. Was it just my imagination, or was there something more sinister at play? All I know is that I'll never forget the chilling encounter with that homeowner, and I'll think twice before taking another late night call in an unfamiliar place. I was staying at this hotel for a business conference, just a routine trip. The place seemed decent enough at first glance, you know? But things started getting weird real quick. I overheard a conversation between some staff members about the hotel's past. They spoke in hushed tones about these unsolved disappearances that had happened years ago. People just vanished without a trace, and the cases were never solved. It sent a chill down my spine, this sinister vibe that lingered in the air. I tried to brush it off as gossip, but there was this lingering feeling that something wasn't right about this place. That night, as I was about to fall asleep, strange things started happening. I heard these faint whispers, like voices echoing in the room, but there was no one there. It felt like the walls held secrets, secrets I wasn't supposed to know. The air grew heavy, suffocating almost. It was like this invisible weight pressing down on me. I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched, this unsettling sensation that someone or something was lurking in the shadows. I turned on all the lights, trying to push away the fear, but it didn't help. The room felt colder, this bone-chilling coldness that made me shiver. It wasn't just a draft, it felt unnatural. Then there were these odd occurrences. My belongings started disappearing, small things at first, like my pen or hairbrush. I thought I was being forgetful, misplacing them, but then it escalated. I'd leave the room for a few minutes, and when I returned, everything would be rearranged. Furniture moved, items shifted around. It was as if someone had been in there while I was out, but the door was always locked. I couldn't shake off this feeling of dread, this fear that I was caught in something I couldn't explain. I asked the hotel staff, but they dismissed it, said it was probably just my imagination. One night, I woke up to this sound, this scraping noise coming from inside the walls. It was faint at first, but it grew louder, this persistent scratching that made my blood run cold. I felt this primal fear, this terror that something was trying to get in something sinister and unexplainable. I called the front desk, 
but they didn't take me seriously. They promised to send someone to check, but no one came. I tried to sleep, to ignore the sounds, but they continued this relentless scratching that seemed to come from all directions. I felt this overwhelming sense of being trapped, this fear that something was lurking just beyond the walls. Then, there were these moments of darkness, like the lights flickering for no reason. It wasn't a power surge, it felt intentional, this eerie darkness that lasted just a moment but left me trembling. I couldn't take it anymore. I requested to change rooms, hoping it would make things better, but it only got worse. The strange occurrences followed me, this feeling of being trapped in a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. I started seeing things, shadows moving in the corners, shapes that shouldn't have been there. I tried to convince myself it was my mind playing tricks, but it felt too real, too terrifying to be just my imagination. The whispers returned, this time clearer, as if they were trying to tell me something, but I couldn't understand. It was like voices from another time, another dimension, haunting me with their secrets. I researched the hotel's history, digging into those unsolved disappearances. It sent chills down my spine, it was true, people had gone missing from here, without a trace, without any explanation. The fear consumed me, this terror of not knowing what was happening, this feeling that the hotel held dark secrets that were meant to stay hidden. I tried to leave, to check out and put an end to this nightmare, but something stopped me. It was as if the hotel itself didn't want me to leave, as if it was holding me captive in its sinister grip. I felt this overwhelming sense of being watched, this feeling that someone or something was always there, just out of sight. It was suffocating, this fear that I was at the mercy of forces beyond my understanding. In the end, I left, but the terror stayed with me. It felt like I had escaped a nightmare. I was staying in this fancy hotel for a business trip, just trying to wind down after a long day of meetings. It was late, and I was getting ready to call it a night when there was a knock on my door. I wasn't expecting anyone, especially not room service. I hesitated but decided to open it, thinking it might be a mistake. The hotel staff member had a tray with covered dishes. I was confused, I hadn't ordered anything. I told him that, but he insisted it was for my room and said it was complimentary from the hotel. It seemed odd, but I let him in, thinking maybe it was a nice gesture from the hotel management. He placed the tray on the table and left quickly without saying much. I found it strange, but I was hungry, so I lifted the covers to see what was there. The sight made my blood run cold. There were strange items, photos, old toys, and newspaper clippings, all arranged in a bizarre way that sent chills down my spine. I couldn't make sense of it. The photos looked old, like they were taken decades ago. Some were of kids, their faces obscured or scratched out. The toys were worn out, and the newspaper clippings had articles about missing children. I felt this overwhelming sense of dread, this feeling that something was very wrong. My heart raced, and I started feeling sick to my stomach. I wondered if this was some kind of sick prank or if there was a mix-up with another room. I called the front desk, trying to explain what happened, but they insisted there must have been a mistake. They said they'd send someone up to collect the items and investigate. I couldn't shake off this feeling of fear, this sense of being targeted or watched. I locked the door and stayed up the whole night, too scared to sleep, too terrified of what those items might mean. The hotel staff came in the morning to collect the tray, but they seemed dismissive, like they were trying to downplay the situation. They assured me it was just a mix-up and that I shouldn't worry. But I couldn't shake off the images I saw, the disturbing arrangement of those items. I tried to go about my day, but I couldn't focus, couldn't get the thoughts out of my head. I decided to do some digging of my own, 
searching online for any news about missing children in the area. And to my horror, I found articles matching the dates on those newspaper clippings. It felt surreal, this sinking feeling that those items might be connected to real tragedies. I called the police, telling them about what happened, but they seemed skeptical and said they'd look into it. I felt this paralyzing fear, this sense of being entangled in something dark and disturbing. I couldn't trust anyone, not knowing if this was a terrible mistake or something more sinister. I checked out of the hotel, unable to stay there another minute. I felt this need to get away, to distance myself from that place and those eerie items. The police contacted me later, saying they investigated but found nothing suspicious. They dismissed it as a mix-up, but I knew what I saw, why I felt it was real. I needed a break from it all, the constant hum of everyday life, the people, the noise. So, I decided to escape to the Coconino National Forest in Arizona, hoping the vast wilderness would offer the solitude I craved. Armed with nothing but my backpack and a map, I ventured into the unknown, straying off the marked trails in search of that elusive peace. The dense forest surrounded me, towering trees creating a natural canopy that muted the outside world. At first, it felt liberating. The stillness was a stark contrast to the chaos I left behind. But as I delved deeper, an uneasiness settled in. The quiet, once serene, now felt oppressive, like a weight pressing down on me. I was lost in my thoughts, navigating the uneven terrain when a subtle rustle in the bushes caught my attention. Brushing it off as wildlife, I continued, the crunching of leaves beneath my boots the only sound in the secluded woods. That's when it started, the feeling of being watched. It crawled up my spine, a primal instinct telling me I wasn't alone. As I walked, the sensation of eyes on me persisted. I glanced around, half expecting to find another hiker sharing the solitude. But the forest remained silent, except for the rhythmic thud of my own footsteps. My senses heightened, every snap of a twig or distant rustle amplifying the growing tension. The unease reached its peak when I stumbled upon a makeshift campsite hidden among the trees. A tattered tent and remnants of a fire suggested someone had been there recently. Anxiety nodded in my stomach, who else could be wandering these woods? I quickened my pace, trying to shake off the feeling of impending danger. The dense foliage seemed to close in, sunlight struggling to penetrate the thick canopy. The quiet became suffocating, broken only by the occasional creak of branches overhead. It was then that I noticed him, a shadow lurking at the periphery of my vision. I turned, catching a glimpse of a solitary figure blending with the trees. Panic set in as I realized I was being followed. The man, disheveled and gaunt, stared at me with vacant eyes. A chill ran down my spine, his presence exuded a malevolence that transcended words. I changed directions, hoping to lose him in the labyrinth of trees. Yet, each time I glanced over my shoulder, he was there, always at a distance but never too far. The dense foliage seemed to conspire with him, twisting into a confusing maze that disoriented me further. Fear became my constant companion. I quickened my pace, feeling the weight of his gaze on my back. The forest, once a refuge, now felt like a trap closing in on me. My breaths were labored, my heart pounding in my chest as I navigated the labyrinth of trees, each step a struggle against the ever-present threat. As the sunlight waned, casting eerie shadows among the trees, I knew I couldn't outrun him forever. The forest, once a sanctuary, had become a battleground for my survival. I stumbled over roots and rocks, my legs aching with exertion, my mind racing to comprehend the peril I found myself in. I finally burst through the trees into a small clearing, the last rays of sunlight casting long shadows. 
gasping for breath, I dared to look back. The man emerged from the shadows, his malevolent gaze fixed on me. The distance between us had shortened, his intentions no longer veiled. Panic set in as I realized escape was futile. In that isolated clearing, I confronted the stark reality. The solitude I saw had become a perilous encounter with a stranger whose intentions were anything but benign. We moved into our new house in the quiet suburban neighborhood last month, eager for a fresh start. The place had this idyllic charm, white picket fences, and friendly neighbors. Everything seemed perfect until our mysterious neighbor started showing up uninvited. It all began innocently. One evening, the doorbell rang, and there she was, Mrs. Anderson, our next-door neighbor. She had this warm smile and claimed she just wanted to welcome us to the neighborhood. Seemed friendly enough, so we exchanged pleasantries, and she left. But the visits became more frequent. Mrs. Anderson appeared at our doorstep during odd hours, sometimes with a plate of cookies or just a chat. It was becoming unsettling. We barely knew her, yet she acted like an old friend. One evening, she arrived with a homemade casserole. I appreciated the gesture but couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Her eyes lingered too long and her questions were too personal. It was like she was prying into our lives, wanting to know every detail. My unease grew, especially when she mentioned things she shouldn't know. She knew our schedules, where the kids went to school, and even what we did on weekends. I felt like our privacy was slipping away, and I couldn't understand how she knew so much. Late one night, as we were putting the kids to bed, the doorbell rang again. I hesitated but opened it to find Mrs. Anderson standing there, uninvited. She insisted she heard a noise and wanted to make sure everything was okay. It felt like an invasion, and I asked her to leave. Days turned into weeks, and her surprise visits persisted. I noticed her watching our house from her window. Paranoia set in, and my thoughts were consumed by this mysterious neighbor. I tried talking to other neighbors, but no one seemed to share my concerns. One day, she brought over a gift, a potted plant. I thanked her, but the sinister undertone remained. It was like she was marking her territory, claiming a space in our lives we weren't willing to give. Things escalated when I caught her snooping around our backyard. She claimed she lost her cat and thought it wandered into our yard. But something in her eyes told me it wasn't about a lost pet. She was watching us, studying our every move. I became paranoid, checking the locks multiple times a day. My children sensed my unease and asked why Mrs. Anderson kept coming over. I had no answers just a growing fear that something wasn't right. One evening, as darkness settled, there was a knock on the door. My heart raced as I opened it to find Mrs. Anderson standing there, a chilling smile on her face. She handed me a handwritten note, inviting us over for dinner. I couldn't refuse, but my gut screamed danger. Dinner at her house was tense. She asked intrusive questions, and her eyes bore into us. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being scrutinized, analyzed. As we left, she whispered something chilling, I'm always here for you. That night, I couldn't sleep. The note, the constant presence, the invasion of our lives, it was too much. I decided to confide in another neighbor, hoping they'd experience something similar. To my shock, they said Mrs. Anderson was a widow, living alone for years. No cat, no family. My fears escalated. Was she a harmless neighbor trying to be friendly, or was she something more sinister? I started researching the history of the house, the neighborhood, anything that could explain her behavior. 
Late one night, I found a news article from years ago. Mrs. Anderson's husband had died in our house. The article hinted at suspicions of foul play but lacked concrete evidence. My blood ran cold. Was I living in a crime scene? The next day, I confronted Mrs. Anderson, armed with the newfound knowledge. She denied everything, claiming the article was sensationalized. But her eyes betrayed a hint of guilt, a darkness that couldn't be ignored. I contacted the police, sharing my concerns and the eerie history of our house. They promised to investigate, but every shadow felt like a potential threat. We thought it'd be a dreamy getaway, renting this floating house in the Florida Keys. It sat on the water, isolated from the hustle and bustle. Picture-perfect sunsets and gentle waves lulling us to sleep, that's what we expected. First day's fine, soaking in the sun, taking pictures. We noticed this island in the distance, not too far. Seemed uninhabited, just mangroves and shadows. But as the sun dipped low, we saw something that shouldn't be there, a silhouette on the island. At first, we dismissed it as a trick of the light. But it moved, slow and deliberate. My partner grabbed the binoculars, squinting towards that mysterious figure. Too far to make out details, just a dark shape against the fading sunlight. Night falls, and we hear a distant hum, a bow approaching. We peek out see a small dinghy approaching the island. The silhouette's there, pacing the shoreline. No lights, just darkness against the moonlit water. Next day, we kayak over to the island. Maybe it's a lost soul or someone needing help. As we paddle closer, the figure retreats into the trees. There's a small structure there, weathered and forgotten. No sign of life, just an unsettling stillness. We explore the island cautiously, feeling eyes on us. Footprints in the sand, leading towards the interior. We follow, drawn by a sense of unease. The structure's an old shack, remnants of a life left behind. Creaky floorboards, rusty tools, it's like stumbling into a memory frozen in time. Hours pass, and the sun starts its descent. We leave the island, uneasy but convinced it's just an abandoned outpost. That night, we see a faint light on the island, dancing between the trees. A lantern, maybe? We debate whether to investigate but decide against it. The unknown feels dangerous. The next morning, we find something washed up on our floating house's deck, a torn piece of fabric, wet and stained. It's not ours. Panic sets in, and we question whether we're alone out here. We call the rental agency, but they dismiss it as debris. Days go by, and the island becomes a looming presence. That figure's always there, watching. We try to enjoy the sunsets, but that mysterious lantern dances in the distance, a macabre ballet. One night, we hear a splash. Rushing outside, we see ripples in the water. Someone was here, just moments ago. Panic takes over, we lock all the doors. The island seems closer in the darkness, like it's encroaching on our sanctuary. Sleep's elusive as the distant hum returns, circling our floating refuge. We huddle together, trying to rationalize. Maybe it's just a fisherman or a lost traveler. But the fear's infectious, and every creak of the house becomes a harbinger of dread. One morning, we decide to confront the island. It's consuming our thoughts, invading our peace. As we approach, the shack's door swings open, a slow creak in the silence. The lantern sits on the porch, still warm to the touch. Inside, we find a journal, entries about solitude, loss, and a creeping darkness. It's the diary of someone driven to the edge by isolation. The last entry speaks of the island being a sanctuary, a place to escape a world that had forgotten. Reality sets in, we're not alone. 
Someone's been living in the shadows, sharing our sunsets and watching our every move. Fear turns to anger. We call the authorities, but they're hours away. We're on our own. Night falls, and the hum of a boat grows louder. The figure, now visible, approaches our floating house. We lock everything, praying they'll pass. But they don't. Shadows dance outside our windows, and a voice echoes, words lost in the wind. Suddenly, it stops. Silence. We peek outside, see the figure disappearing into the night. Relief washes over, but it's short-lived. The hum returns, louder than before. They're not leaving. They're circling, waiting for the right moment. As dawn breaks, we see the dinghy tied to our floating home. The figure's gone, leaving only traces of a terrifying presence. We pack frantically, leave behind the floating house that turned from dream to nightmare. Days later, safe on solid ground, we hear news of a hermit living in the Keys, someone who'd shunned society. They found the shack, the diary, the remnants of a life chosen in solitude. The figure was a lonely soul, seeking refuge in our proximity. The fear lingers, though. The feeling of being watched, of a presence just beyond the horizon. It was a winter night, snow falling in thick flakes, covering the world in a cold, white blanket. I was home alone, cozy by the fireplace, lost in a book. The wind held outside, creating an eerie symphony that matched the isolation of the night. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. It wasn't a regular, polite knock. It was forceful, demanding attention. I felt a chill run down my spine. Who could be knocking so aggressively on a night like this? I hesitated, debating whether to answer. The knocks continued, growing louder. Anxiety crawled up my chest, but I mustered the courage to check. I peeked through the curtains, and my heart skipped a beat. A figure stood on the doorstep, obscured by the darkness. I couldn't make out any features, just the silhouette of a person standing there. Fear gripped me, but I opened the door a crack. The stranger was a man, his face hidden beneath a hood. He seemed agitated, mumbling something about needing help. He claimed his car had broken down, and he was stranded in the cold. My instinct screamed at me to be cautious, but sympathy won over. I told him to wait while I fetched a blanket and offered to call for roadside assistance. As I turned to grab my phone, something felt off. I heard footsteps behind me, slow and deliberate. I froze. Panic set in as I realized I was alone with a stranger in my home. I turned slowly, the man now standing in the doorway, his hood pulled back. His eyes were cold and calculating, sending shivers down my spine. He demanded money, claiming he needed it to get his car towed. I felt a knot in my stomach. Something wasn't right. I tried to stay calm, told him I didn't have cash but that I could call for help. He didn't like that. His demeanor shifted, becoming more aggressive. I could feel the danger in the air. His eyes darted around the room, sizing up the situation. I knew I had to act fast. I fumbled with my phone, pretending to dial for help. But he wasn't buying it. He lunged towards me, demanding my wallet. Fear propelled me into survival mode. I screamed, hoping someone nearby might hear. The struggle was chaotic, my mind racing with thoughts of escape. I managed to break free, bolting towards the door, and ran out into the frigid night. The snow crunched beneath my boots as I sprinted to the nearest neighbor's house. I banged on the door, breathless and terrified. They opened it, 
concern etched on their faces as I gasped out what had happened. They called the police, and I stayed huddled in their living room, waiting for help to arrive. The police searched the area, but the stranger was gone. Moving to a new town was exciting at first. My husband and I had decided to start fresh, leaving behind the hustle and bustle of the city for a quieter life in the suburbs. I threw myself into settling in, attending local events and meeting new people. My husband didn't, he worked remotely so he would always be in the home office. But me, I made friends quickly, finding a sense of belonging in this close-knit community. Everything seemed perfect until I met him. He was charming and confident, and I found myself drawn to him in a way I couldn't explain. We started spending more time together, meeting for coffee or going for walks in the park. I told myself it was harmless, just a friendship, but deep down, I knew there was something more between us. One night, after a few drinks at a local bar, we kissed. It was electric, sending shivers down my spine as I realized how much I had missed the thrill of new love. We would see each other when we could and I would always spend time at his house. But as time went on, Kilt nodded me, reminding me of the vows I had made to my husband. I tried to push him away, to distance myself from the temptation of his touch. But he was persistent, showing up unannounced at my doorstep and sending me messages late into the night. I knew I had to end things before they went any further. I love my husband, despite our problems, and I couldn't bear the thought of betraying him any further. When I told him it was over, he didn't take it well. He begged me to reconsider, pleading with me to give him another chance. But I stood firm, determined to honor my commitment to my husband no matter what. That's when things started to get strange. I would hear footsteps outside my window late at night, or catch glimpses of a figure lurking in the shadows. I told myself it was just my imagination, that I was being paranoid after the affair. But then I started receiving strange messages, cryptic and threatening, warning me to stay away from him. I tried to ignore them, to convince myself they were just a prank, but they kept coming, each one more disturbing than the last. I confided in my husband, hoping he would protect me from whatever was lurking in the darkness. But instead of comforting me, he accused me of lying, of making up stories to cover my guilt. He left me and went to stay with his sister back in our hometown. I felt alone and vulnerable, trapped in a nightmare of my own making. I tried to go about my daily life as if nothing was wrong, but the fear nodded me, eating away at my sanity. One night, as I lay in bed, I heard the sound of someone moving through the house. My heart raced as I listened to the creak of floorboards and the rustle of fabric. I wanted to scream for help, but fear paralyzed me, rendering me powerless to do anything but lie there and wait for the intruder to reveal themselves. When morning came, I found the front door unlocked and the windows open, as if someone had been searching for something in the darkness of the night. I tried to convince myself it was just a coincidence, that I was being paranoid after the affair, but deep down, I knew there was something more sinister at play. I started spending more time away from home, avoiding the places where I felt the most vulnerable. But no matter where I went, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of being hunted. I confided in a friend on FaceTime that I made in the new town, Jasmine, she worked in the local bakers, hoping for some reassurance that I wasn't losing my mind I told her what was happening. But instead of comfort, she offered me a warning, her eyes wide with fear as she spoke of the rumors that had been circulating in town. According to the whispers, there was a man who had been stalking women in the area, watching them from a distance and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I felt a chill run down my spine as I listened to her words, realizing that I was being targeted by someone who meant me harm. My husband was not even answering my calls and I felt so alone. I felt like I was losing my mind, like I was trapped in a nightmare with no way out. I wanted to run, to escape from the darkness that had engulfed my life, but I knew there was nowhere to hide. 
In the end, I was forced to confront him myself, to stand up to the monster who had been terrorizing me for so long. From then on, he backed off but I still didn't feel safe. My husband got in contact about selling the house in a divorce and once the house sold, I moved out into a new town for a fresh start. I have been here for the best part of a year now and have met a new guy called Andy, been with him four months. Life is looking good but looking back on that time of my life sends chills down my spine. The blizzard hit us out of nowhere. One minute, we were driving along the deserted highway. The next, we were surrounded by swirling snow and near zero visibility. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped in the middle of the storm, with no shelter in sight. With each passing minute, the snow piled up around us, threatening to bury our car beneath a thick blanket of white. We tried to keep calm but fear not at the edges of our minds as the temperature plummeted and the wind held outside. As the hours dragged on, our situation grew more dire. The heater in the car struggled to keep up with the biting cold, and our supplies dwindled with each passing hour. We knew we had to find shelter soon or risk freezing to death in the unforgiving cold. But just as we were beginning to lose hope, we spotted a faint glow in the distance, a small cabin nestled among the trees its windows glowing with the warm light of a fire. With renewed determination, we set out into the storm, trudging through the knee-deep snow towards our only hope of survival. As we reached the cabin and stepped inside, relief washed over us like a tidal wave. The air was warm and inviting, a welcome contrast to the frigid cold outside. We huddled together for warmth, grateful to be out of the storm, if only for a moment but our relief was short-lived. As we settled in for the night, a sense of unease settled over us like a thick fog. There was something off about the cabin, something that made the hairs on the back of our necks stand on end. It wasn't until we heard the voices outside that we realized the true danger we were in. Men, their voices muffled by the howling wind, lurked outside the cabin, their intentions unknown. We listened in terror as they discussed their plans, their voices filled with malice and cruelty. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped, with no way to defend ourselves against the unseen threat outside. We searched the cabin for anything we could use as a weapon, but our efforts were futile. We were sitting ducks, at the mercy of whoever lurked outside in the darkness. With each passing moment, the tension inside the cabin grew thicker, until it felt like we were suffocating under its weight. We knew we had to act fast if we wanted to survive the night, but fear held us back, paralyzing us with its icy grip. But as the men outside grew bolder, pounding on the door and shouting threats, we knew we had no choice but to fight back. With trembling hands, we armed ourselves with whatever makeshift weapons we could find, ready to defend ourselves against whatever horrors awaited us outside. As the door splintered under the force of the men's blows, we braced ourselves for the final showdown. With a deafening crash, the door flew open, revealing the men outside, their faces twisted in rage and madness. But before they could make their move, we sprang into action, unleashing a fury of blows upon our attackers. It was a brutal and bloody fight, with each side fighting tooth and nail for survival. In the end, we emerged victorious, battered, and bruised but alive. As we watched the men flee into the darkness, we knew we had narrowly escaped death's clutches once again.